So, for a bit of context, this was right back after 9-11 had just happened. I, female and 24 years old, was driving by myself across country to get to my son who was with my ex. I had been out of state at the time taking care of a sick family member. It was in the middle of night in New Mexico when I suddenly saw police lights appear behind me. I was exhausted and quite annoyed. I hadn't been speeding or anything like that and I didn't think I had any broken lights either. There also weren't really any other cars on the road at that time. I was close to the exit from my hotel that I had planned to stop at for the night. I pulled over to the side and the cop walked over to my driver's side window. This in itself was pretty weird. Usually they would come over to the passenger side window on roads like highways just in case a car came by or something. I gave him all of my registration, license, things like that, but instead of looking it over, he just stared at me for the longest time. It was so awkward. He walked over to his car, but then returned almost immediately without even bothering to check anything. He told me to step outside of the car. Okay, so now I was worried at this point. I had gotten tickets before, but being asked to step outside of the car was not something I'd ever experienced. I immediately did as he said, and he asked me if I had been drinking. I said I hadn't, and then I asked why he'd pulled me over in the first place. He told me he'd seen me driving erratically, which was obviously not true. Then he asked me if I was a terrorist, which was even more absurd. I was a young American white woman just driving, so there was really no reason for him to be asking this question out of nowhere. It was weird, and I also had a veteran's ID too. He gave me a walk the line drunk driving test, which I passed easily obviously. Then he began to tell me he needed to search my car to see if I had any drugs on my person. I thought about this for a minute because I knew my rights and all, but it was already so late and I was tired. I just didn't want to deal with all the BS of refusing, so I gave him the okay. Besides, I knew I didn't have anything like that in my car. When he got to my truck, he opened up a small suitcase I had that was my dancer's stripper stuff. He asked about it and I told him I stripped for a living. This really set him off all of a sudden and he started screaming and berating me for being a trash person. This pissed me off. I started looking around at my situation. I was completely alone for the most part with this weird guy. Every once in a while a car would pass by but for the most part the road was completely empty. It was the middle of the night. I didn't have anything on myself to protect me and he had a gun. He told me I needed to walk back into the tree line that was next to the road. I stared at him and immediately said no. I demanded he call for backup instead and other officers come to sit with us. He was thrown off by this. I said I wanted a female officer and I would no longer comply with anything he said from then on. Then I tried to start weaving down cars as they passed by. The man began to panic and told me to calm down. He wrote out a speeding ticket and let me go. I never paid that ticket, but I also never heard another word about it, and this was 20 years ago. At the time, I was really shaken. I just forgot about it. But looking back, I'm pretty sure that person was not actually a real cop. This happened about five years ago, after my fiancé and I had been living in our house for a little bit over a year. I'm six foot tall and about 225 pounds or so. I've always been naturally muscular, and I've also been told I have a very intimidating demeanor. My fiancé is all of five foot two and weighs maybe 130 pounds soaking wet. A tiny little thing to be sure. Our house is a bi-level home where you walk in the front door and there are two half staircases going up to the living room or down to the basement. The only access to our backyard is through the sliding glass door in the upstairs living room and down the stairs from our deck. This is important. Now to let you know beforehand, during this time I partied quite a lot. Way more than I should have actually. I was between jobs and it was toward the end of the holidays so my interest in finding a new one wasn't quite what it should have been. 
Many of these nights I was out partying, I would end up crashing with friends, which meant my fiancé spent many a night alone with our three dogs. I had a very serious problem with substance abuse at the time, primarily alcohol. I'm sad to say I was letting it get the better of me. Fast forward a couple of months. I had just found a new job that had random drug and alcohol tests. A godsend in hindsight, honestly. I had been sober all of two days, and had begun repairing my relationship with my fiancé when she told me how she was glad that I was sleeping at home again. I thought nothing of this at first and kissed her on the head. I told her I was too, and that I loved her more than anything in the whole world. Later that night, my fiancé and I were watching TV downstairs, when I thought I heard something moving around in our backyard. The dogs apparently heard it too, but I dismissed it because they just perked up their ears but didn't seem to be too alarmed. A moment later though, I heard the noise once again. My fiancé very quickly muted the TV and gave me a very nervous look. Did you hear that? She asked, looking very uncomfortable. I told her it was probably just a few neighborhood cats playing in our bushes as there were quite a few outdoor cats living in the area, but she shook her head and insisted this could not be the case. Before I could even ask her what made her so sure, I heard our sliding glass door upstairs fly open. All three of my Great Danes and myself jumped to our feet in an instant. The dogs let out the most ferocious sounding barks I've ever heard and tore ass upstairs with me right behind them. As I'm rounding the very first set of stairs and the dogs are reaching the top of the second set, I see the sliding glass door slam closed and the silhouette of a man running away. I get to the door and fling it open. The dogs shove me out of the way to chase after this would-be intruder. I grab my flashlight as well, one of those big 4D cell mag lights that cops carry around, and sprinted into the yard. I had just barely made it down the deck stairs when I saw the dogs freaking out at the back fence. I sprinted over and jumped the fence just in time to see the man reaching the opposite fence and trying to climb over it. He was covered head to toe in black clothing, a thick black hoodie, with the hood pulled tight to conceal his face, and jet black cargo pants. Without any regard for my personal safety really, I charged the man and just barely missed grabbing hold of him as he climbed over the top of the fence. Once more I followed him over and came around the front of my neighbor's house just in time to see him hop into a beaten old pickup and speed off in a hurry. I watched for a moment as he tore out of the neighborhood at 90 miles per hour and disappeared into the night. I ran back home as fast as I could to check on my fiancé and make sure she was okay. When I walked into the house, she was sitting in the upstairs living room, surrounded by all three of our Great Danes and clutching the biggest knife we own. She was very visibly shaken. But ultimately, she's a very strong woman at heart and told me she was ready in case I got into trouble. After calling the cops, giving statements, and triple checking to make sure every door and window in the house was locked up tight, we decided to watch another movie, as neither of us were particularly tired after the adrenaline rush we had just been through. During the movie, I asked her what made her so sure before it wasn't just cats playing around in the yard. What she told me was enough for me to decide it was time to change my whole life around. She said that for about a month now while I had been away partying, she had been hearing strange noises coming from all around the house very late at night. She would hear what sounded like footsteps outside, and occasionally what sounded like hushed whispering. When I asked her why she never told anyone, she just shook her head and said she didn't really know. After hearing all of this, I came to the sudden realization that whoever this man was, he knew that I was never home at night, and my fiancé essentially was all alone most of the time. Fortunately for us though, he somehow missed the fact that we have three Great Danes, and for whatever reason, on this particular night he decided not to check before making his move and make sure she was alone again. Since that day, I've been 100% sober from everything, five years total as of March 1st and I've never left my fiancé alone overnight since. Our relationship has never been stronger, and our three Great Danes are three of the best dogs anyone could ever ask for. In the end, this experience changed my life completely for the better, so I guess I have to thank that creepy wannabe burglar, but I hope I never meet them again.
for their sake. Yesterday, Saturday morning, my kid, who's two years old, had been running out the back door and having us chase her for a while. It was a naughty habit and could be quite scary sometimes when she just bolted out of the door with no warning. She did that again this day, and I ran out after her, saying, Wait for mommy! She had just gone down the deck stairs a bit. I was right there behind her, when blam, blam! Gunshots and a man running right in front of us through the alley behind my house with a small silver handgun pointed down the alley behind him. He was in a black pleather jacket and green hoodie, scarcely older than a teenager. He had this determined, unflappable air to him, though, that sent chills down my spine. I can't even begin to describe it. He was so close to us, there wasn't time to do anything more than grab my child and duck behind the chicken coop. City hens were allowed here. I guess I figured he'd keep running down the alley to escape, and we could just crouch there until he disappeared. Only, that's not what he did. He hung a hard left and jumped my neighbor's fence, the neighbor whose yard borders my chicken enclosure. This guy walked within feet of us. He started to exit by the neighbor's gate. Then, and this moment will stay with me for eternity, he hears my toddler scream crying, the only sound around in that moment. He stops with his hand on the gun and turns to look for the source of the crying. I couldn't hide any more than I already was, and if he turned his head just an inch more, he would instantly see us. Somehow in that moment, I managed to squeeze and lean just enough out of sight that he just barely didn't see us. There was something in his very calm energy that petrified me. A shooter who had just had a gun battle in the middle of the day in a little family neighborhood seemed to give no fucks naturally if others were hurt. I had this horrible cold dread wash over me in that moment. If he turned all the way and saw us, saw me, saw my expression, he would have to shoot me because I knew my face was saying, I saw what you did. It was the most terrifying moment of my entire life. I felt perched between utter peril and life the breathing, screaming life in my arms. Would he turn that little gun on us in that moment? Somehow, incredibly, miraculously, and amazingly, as though the pull of investigating the crying so close by him was suddenly overwhelmed by his desire to get the fuck out of Dodge, he put his gun into his pocket and exited through the gate, sprinting across the street. He jumped across the street neighbor's fence and disappeared. I smacked my kid's head in my haste to get us back inside, and freaking out, I pulled all the curtains and locked the doors tight. Then, I spent the next ten goddamn minutes getting put on hold by 911. When the cops arrived, I gave them my eyewitness account, and my neighbor who had been about to take her trash out and saw it all gave the same eyewitness account. They caught the guy he was shooting at, but they never caught the shooter I actually saw. It still sends chills down my spine. What if he came back? What if those bullets had struck my toddler, running down towards the shooter? A little girl was recently killed in the exact same way at a park we frequent, sprayed with bullets from a gun battle in the middle of the day, in the middle of a playground. It makes me sick to my stomach, and I'm not even sure I want to live in this city or this country anymore. So, a few years back during my senior year of high school, my stepdad made a very poor decision. His decision has caused a lot of pain and suffering for my mom and I, and we're both still in counseling for PTSD and anxiety disorders. Just for a little bit of context, my parents got divorced when I was 7 years old. Also, I'm a female if that matters to anyone. I was used to them each dating other people, and I was actually very happy for my mom when she told me she'd met somebody new. That was until I actually met him. As soon as I met this guy who we'll call Don, I immediately got a horrible feeling in my gut. Don was originally from Florida, and he moved to Kentucky right before he met my mom, leaving behind his ex-wife and son. A bit of a red flag. 
He was just a weirdo in every single sense of the word. He would always try and start an argument over petty topics or walk around shirtless with his strange nipple rings out while my friends were over. Although he was weird though, he was never really threatening or abusive at all towards either of us. That is, until one night right before my mom's birthday. I remember that night very clearly. It was my best friend's birthday and I was waiting for her to come pick me up to go to dinner. My mom and Don also had plans to go out that night and watch the UK-Florida basketball game. As an only child, my mom has always been very protective over me, so she wanted to wait until I left with my friend before she left with Don. This, for whatever reason, really pissed Don off and he stormed out of the house without her. I left very shortly after. I returned around four or five hours later. The game had been over for quite some time now, and Don still had not come home yet. My mom was acting very weird and nervous when I asked about him though, and just ushered me off to go to sleep. As I was sleeping, I was woken up by my mom screaming my name. Obviously disoriented, I groped around for my phone, thinking I must have overslept and was now late for school. When I checked the time though, it was near midnight. My mom screamed my name again and told me to shut my door and call 911. This was pretty much when the shit hit the fan. I started freaking out and jumped up to slam my door closed and lock it. Right in the moment I did this, three gunshots flew through my bedroom door, just narrowly missing me. I grabbed my phone and jumped to the other side of my bed. I laid flat on the ground, hoping to avoid any more bullets coming my way. I barely even had time to get out my address and inform them that someone was trying to kill me before I heard my mom scream one last time, before two more gunshots rang out. Everything suddenly fell silent. I had the most horrible feeling that someone had just killed my mom and I'd heard it. I got up from the floor when I heard the person begin to throw themselves against my door in an attempt to break in. All that was running through my mind was getting to my mom and staying alive. Eventually, though, he broke my door down. I was horrified to see my stepdad standing there. His eyes were glazed over as he grabbed me by my shirt collar and put the barrel of the gun to my head. I screamed and fought as he said over and over, Is this what you wanted? At this point, a lot of the details get hazy. I had a ridiculous amount of adrenaline pumping through me, but I somehow managed to back him up and shove him down onto my bed. I used both of my hands to grab hold of his with a gun and push it away from me. I tried with all my might to get it up against his head so I could blow his brains out. We struggled like this for a while, until my mom came inside, gunshot wound to the neck and stomach. She laid her body across the gun while telling me to run. I hysterically ran out my front door and up the street to my neighbor's house. I scared them half to death, but I was able to redial 911 and explain exactly what was happening. As I was over at my neighbor's, my mom was still in my room with my stepdad. She says this was when she became very weak from blood loss and rolled off of him onto the ground. She begged him and asked why he was doing this. In an answer, he simply put his gun up to his mouth. She took this opportunity to run out the front door, right into the arms of a police officer. In the end, the police ended up having a standoff with Don as he barricaded himself inside. He made the mistake of pointing a gun at them though, and they blew his dick off and then arrested him. He's currently serving 45 years in prison, and to this day he'll give no reason as to why he suddenly decided to do this to us. In all honesty though, I don't care. My mom and I lived through it and have grown closer because of it. We actually got matching tattoos reading strength comes from the madness we survive. And Don, I really hope everyone in prison enjoys you and your now half penis. This was back in 2015 when I was just 16 years old. I'm a man, by the way. This was in summer where both my parents went to visit some of the relatives out of town. They wouldn't be home for three or so days. I was the only child, and I was the only one left in the house. My grandma did visit me every single day to make me lunch. 
They didn't ask that, mind you, since I did know how to cook at the time, but nobody could stop my grandma when she wanted to do something. Of course, she wouldn't stay over during the night, though. That's when I would go wild. Watching movies, gaming, watching YouTube, eating whatever I wanted. Everything you could picture a 16-year-old doing when his parents aren't there to watch him. So the second night, I was watching a movie and ran out of chips. I paused the movie and went down to the kitchen to grab some more. All of a sudden, though, I could hear a window shattering and the door opening right up. The kitchen was separate from the living room where the door was being opened. I grabbed a knife and slowly peeked my head around the corner. I could see there a man around two meters tall. He had a baseball cap on, some old jacket, probably leather, and it was torn all on the right sleeve. My phone was locked up in the room upstairs. From the kitchen door, the stairs were directly to its right, so in my dumbass mind, I was thinking I could sneak past him and lock myself in. He immediately started going through the shelf right next to the door, very loudly, I must say, as well. Somehow, I managed to solid snake sneak my way up the stairs. He turned around, though, and realized I was there. Out of fear in that moment, I screamed and threw my knife at him. I missed him, but hit the wall beside his head. The knife stuck in there tight. I guess he got scared by that and my savage screaming. He ran out, throwing things from the shelf at me before I could grab my knife once more. When I saw he'd left, I ran to my room and called the cops. They came quickly and took some fingerprints and any DNA samples they could find. The next morning, I called my parents. They came back around noontime. I don't know why, but I kept the knife lodged in the wall next to the door. Maybe as a bit of pride in how I'd reacted so quickly in that moment. Of course, the first question they asked when they got home is why there was a knife protruding from the wall. We changed the front door to a more heavy-duty one that wasn't so easily opened. They arrested the guy within the very same week. One of the cops actually told me the guy thought I was going to kill him and had tried to call the police on me for an attempted murder. I guess the moral of the story is to just hide when someone's robbing your house. Either that or learn how to act like a crazy maniac, I guess. Long time lurker, personally hoping I would never have a story to share of my own. Unfortunately, two weeks ago, this started. In hindsight, I guess it started a long time ago, actually. My now husband and I moved in together almost four years ago to a rather nice, albeit expensive, apartment complex in a sort of nice part of town. We're on the third floor with a large balcony that looks out onto the courtyard in which the other apartments in the complex are located. Basically, you can see all the other balconies and living rooms of the other tenants, and the open stairwells as well. For about a year or so, everything went by without a hitch. My husband works at a bar, so he would come home late at night. Usually, I would make it home at around 5 or so. It was easy to get to any apartment doorway, as the complex was large and open, with no security doors except the door to the apartment. This started in August of 2016. I would be home after work chilling and watching TV, almost always around 9.30pm, when I would hear someone come up the stairs. Things would get quiet all of a sudden, and then there would be loud, sharp knocks on my door. I didn't move because it was startling but eventually I went to look at the peephole. I could see there stood three people with all black hoodies on, all seemingly staring into the peephole like they could see me. I didn't answer the door, of course, and after a while they just left. Cue to a few weeks later, the same time, but in this incidence, footsteps and then loud, hard bangs on the door, so loud they sent my cat flying to hide. I sat there frozen. I said to myself, Maybe it's the police or something. I went over to the peephole once again. This time, there was only one person. Dark hoodie, male, white, and very, very gaunt, with these huge black eyes. Again, I did not answer the door. Instead, I grabbed a kitchen knife that I kept by my side, until my husband eventually arrived home. This continued on for weeks, and once when my husband was home as well. He proceeded to look out the peephole, 
saw those very same people and screamed for them to leave. They did as soon as they heard him. We called maintenance and the police, who both stated they would do regular patrols, but nothing else other than that. They also suggested we install cameras. After we did, everything stopped for a while, maybe six months or so during the winter. This helped me be at ease, because when all of this was happening, I was having a very hard time sleeping, and I stopped going out at night as well. However, I assume the same man started up again. This time, the same large bangs on the door would happen. But instead, when I would look out the peephole to see, no one would be there. I became horrified, as I started to notice extinguished cigarette butts by the side of my door, like someone had been standing there and waiting. Again, we reported it. Security stepped up in the area, but I still did not feel safe. I was hoping it would all just stop, as I now felt tortured in my own home. I realized two weeks ago, though, that things could be much worse. At night, to go to bed, I would have to cross our eating area, which was right in front of our giant sliding glass door that led out onto our balcony. It was late at night. All the lights were off in the apartment. As I was walking by... I just happened to glance over. Across the courtyard standing there, I could see the exact same man standing on the landing of the stairs across the way, from the third to second floor, staring right into my balcony. He was just standing there, completely unmoved and facing my direction. The same man who had been at my door. I went numb. My heart was racing. I was chilled to the bone. I knew logically he couldn't possibly see me because the lights were off the stairway had no lights of its own, and it was so far away. But needless to say, I was scared shitless. I called my husband who rushed over, but by the time he got there, the man had long since left. Few more reports to the front office, more promised security patrols. This same creepy dead-eyed man in the black hoodie continued to stand at the stairway landing though, staring at my apartment. Every Friday for two weeks now, I'm horrified and I've been having awful nightmares about someone breaking in and strangling me in my sleep. So, it's been a couple years since this happened, but it still bothers me to this day. I was in college, and I lived in a house with five roommates. I lived on the second floor, the way it was set up is kind of important. There were four bedrooms on the second floor and two bathrooms. Two of the bedrooms each shared a bathroom, which was accessible only by the bedrooms and not the hall. This meant I could walk through the bathroom into my roommate's room and vice versa. My door had both a handle lock and a deadbolt, which I used every single night. It had been a habit I'd developed since freshman year, because in dorms, drunk roommates or floor mates tend to just wander in and wreak havoc if you don't. The door to the bathroom, however, did not have a lock, so I could never secure that room. One of my roommates had her boyfriend visiting, and he'd brought a friend along with him. Now, I hadn't spoken to the friend or gotten to know him at all. I didn't really have any opportunities to, since I didn't hang out in any of the common areas of the house. Frequently, I didn't even sleep there because I was casually seeing someone at the time. My first interaction with him was about two days into his visit. I was coming home around 6 a.m. from the house of the guy I was seeing when I walked into the living room. When I walked in, the visitor was alone and shirtless in my kitchen, which was open to the living room. He didn't even bother to say hello. He just angrily asked me, Where were you? I was taken aback. He sounded like a jealous boyfriend, but I told him I had been at my actual boyfriend's house. Immediately, he said, You didn't tell me you had a boyfriend. Well, of course I hadn't told him. I had never actually spoken to him or really even seen him. I made a weird face at him and just went upstairs. I didn't see him again for the rest of the day. I slept in my own room that same night, deadbolt firmly secure. I woke up at around 7 the next morning, though, to him entering my room from the bathroom. Before I could even say anything, he saw that he'd woken me up. Sorry I wandered into your room, I was just looking for the bathroom. Well, you were just standing in it, so... Immediately he retreated and closed the door tight. 
I didn't think much of it at the time because I was so groggy. I just fell back asleep instead. Now, despite all of this, up until this point, he hadn't really had an opportunity to do anything truly creepy. He just seemed kind of weird. Later that day, though, is when it got a lot worse. I came home from my classes and went up to my room. He followed me and let himself in without even knocking. The door had been firmly closed as well. I made it clear this was not okay. He said he was just being friendly, though. We chatted normally for a couple of minutes, because I didn't want to be rude to my flatmate's guest. Then, though, he decided to say this. You know, I think you're the one. The moment I saw you, I knew it was you, and you're going to marry me. Obviously, I was taken aback by this, as this was only our third interaction ever. We'd spoken for a grand total of two minutes. Obviously, I had no interest in marrying this man. I wasn't even attracted to him. I told him to leave me alone now. I decided to leave and called the guy I was seeing. I told him what was going on, and he told me I could stay over at his house until this weirdo finally left. Well, since then, a couple of days go by. The weirdo was supposed to have left for good, so I went back to my house expecting everything to be fine. I slept in my room that night with the door locked as usual. Only, I woke up to hear someone trying to come in through my main door. I thought it must have been one of my roommates. Only a few seconds later, I hear the bathroom door slowly open and someone creeps into my room. I rolled over, only to see him standing a foot away from my bed looking over me. Hey there, beautiful. Where you been? Weren't you supposed to leave? Why the fuck are you in my room right now? Well, you know, I was supposed to, but I wanted to wait for you to come home. I just couldn't leave without saying goodbye, you know. He tried to climb into my bed with me and started to grab me while saying, Scoot over. I want to say goodbye properly. I started screaming. Get the fuck out of my room. I didn't invite you in. Leave now. I smacked his hands away from me. He got upset, but luckily he left without much more of a fight. Immediately, I left my house and went to my boyfriend's. The guy did finally leave later that morning. Afterward, I told my friend what her guest had done. You know what she said? Well, you must have let him on then. Of course, this prompted me to ask her how I could have possibly let him on if I'd never even had a conversation with him. Of course, she proceeded to blame all his actions on me and tell me I should have been flattered and given him a chance. I just walked away from her at that point and never talked to her again after that year, and haven't since that day. The next day, despite me yelling profanities at him and telling me how creepy he was when I'd last seen him in my bedroom, the guy stalked me on all of my social media and tried to add me. Nope. Blocked right away. To get this started, to some it may not sound the most scary, but having a stranger press up against you and block you from leaving is horrifying especially when young. Normally I try to cover for my mother, but as I've grown older, I've started to kind of blame her a bit, especially after the thing she said. She just loves to invalidate her oldest daughter. I'd say I was around 8 years old at the time this took place. At the time, we had to get mail from the post office in town, and so, seeing my mom get the mail, my brain decided, wow, I want to be cool and get the mail just like my mom. That childish need to prove that I was mature. Eventually, after some time and a lot of begging, my mom let me go to get the mail. On to the actual story. I would guess it was a weekend, as the post office was actually closed. You could still grab the mail, though. Just no people that worked there were there that day. I asked my mom if I could grab it myself as we slowly pulled up outside the post office. She nodded and handed me the keys that had the mail key on them, as well as a few others. Very loud and jingly keys. I jumped out of our old van and ran up the ramp to the building, avoiding the stairs altogether. I opened the door and could see a lady and a man getting their mail as well. Turning to the side, I also saw an older man sitting in the corner, staring at me. He gave me weird vibes even as a kid, 
but I still gave him a quick smile and wave. Bad move, though. The man smiled back, revealing his stained teeth. I walked past him and went to the mailbox. Me being me, though, I had forgotten what key was actually the appropriate one. I began fumbling awkwardly as the others grabbing mail left the building. After maybe three to five minutes of trying and failing, I finally unlocked it on my own. I was so happy that I disregarded the man staring as I grabbed up the mail inside. With a quick click of the lock, I closed the box and began to walk away. I found the gaze of the man, though, as he looked at me. A crooked smile spread across his face. The look he gave me still gives me chills to this day, almost a decade later as an adult. I put my open hand against the door and began to push it open when a pair of arms reached out around me. One hand forcefully pulled the door shut, the other wrapped around the upper part of my chest around my collarbone, pulling me into a tight, unwelcome, and horrible hug. I froze in that moment. What was I supposed to do in this situation? I was always taught to respect adults, and I did. He had a strong scent of alcohol on him, so much that I coughed from the scent. He began to speak after just a moment of holding me there. His words scared me so badly I kind of blocked them out. Now I only remember part of what he said, and I wish I did not. Hey, hey, where are you going in such a hurry? He spoke almost passive-aggressively. Oh, uh, I have to go. My mom is waiting for me, I stuttered. Oh, okay, okay. He sounded defeated and began to let me go, but before I could break away, he grabbed me even tighter than before. Wait, wait, wait. I have a dog, you know. He put that stupid grin on his face. Yeah, yeah, you should come with me, and you can play with him together, he encouraged. The scary thing is I almost went with him in that moment. The next maybe eight minutes felt like hours as he let me go and pulled me hard into him, his scruffy beard and soft, dirty coat brushing against my skin. The details make my head hurt to remember. But he kept telling me, no, almost ordering me to go with him. Finally, he just seemed to snap altogether. All right, you're coming with me. What? But I need my mom. I have her keys and she's waiting for me. Please, let me go. That was still my priority in that moment. Her keys and mail. No, you're not going anywhere but with me now. He opened the door and began to pull me out. In a moment of his weakness, though, I managed to break away, running to my mom in her car. I slammed the door shut, scaring my brother and my mother. I began shaking and crying, dropping the mail on the car floor. I shakily picked it up and handed everything to my mom. As she demanded to know what happened, I told her everything, and she immediately looked pissed. I was so glad she was on my side. I looked outside, tears still streaming down my face. I could notice the man staring at me through the car window from the top ramp of the building. I began to cry harder and panic as he started coming over. My mom stopped me as she noticed him approaching. What was her reason for thinking he was completely harmless? He fell down at the bottom of the ramp. He tripped, so he must be harmless. My mom just laughed at that creep and started driving away. She tried to comfort me, saying things like, He was a harmless old drunk man, and at least he didn't hurt you. Now, years later, I brought it up to my dad when I was at his house. My parents divorced three years after this. I thought that he knew, but my mom had never told him. He was so furious, but I managed to calm him down. He was pissed my mom didn't come for me sooner, and that she hadn't done more in that moment. I told him not to confront my mom on my behalf, and he agreed. Now, not long after telling my dad, I brought it up to my mom again. My mom said I was being a drama queen. I would never get hurt. The man had never tried anything after all. I was furious. But now, I don't even know if I should be. I mean, I know drunk slurring now, but this was almost spiteful, and his tone was so domineering. The questions I'll leave you all with are what were his intentions, and am I right to be mad at my mom after all these years?
So this happened earlier in this year. For a little bit of background, I'm a 30-year-old male, married and was 29 at the time this happened. I also have a young daughter. I live in a very rural Northern California town, pretty much right in the epicenter of the gold rush, really. I don't know if it's all the ways the land was taken or the ways people killed for wealth back then, but it's always seemed to have a higher share of strange recluses and those sovereign citizen types. That being said, this is not a haunting story or a strange people of the woods story, but it was by far the most frightening encounter I've ever experienced as a father. Some time ago, I ended up with an extra day off. My wife and I decided to go out for a drive and check out a semi-local gun show. From time to time, I'd get tables at them, and I also had friends who did them regularly as well, so we often went to visit. I was always looking for obscure parts and pieces of old military weapons. I also happened to have some family that lived in the area of this particular show, too. We had a hell of a winter last year, so unsurprisingly, it was a very cold, gloomy day. We drove for about an hour and knew the promoters, so we just walked right in. As I was passing by tables and searched for the right stuff, I was carrying my daughter in my arms. She was small and ridiculously cute as well, so everyone we passed wanted to look and ask about her a bit. This was pretty normal, from what I've observed from other parents. At times, you can even draw a small crowd to yourself, usually composed of sweet LOLs, little old ladies, and some grandpa types as well. As a side point, I had this one grumpy lady tell me she was way too young. I looked at her confused since we were at a gun show and said she was only three months old and she'd probably never remember. Anyway, there was this one man who seemed a bit more excited than most others his age. It wasn't particularly weird at first, though. He claimed he had worked as an EMT and in an NICU for years, so it seemed reasonable he was happy to see such a healthy baby. As the afternoon went on, though, he passed us by several more times, always moving against the crowd. He would comment on how beautiful she was. As babies often do at that age, my wife soon needed to breastfeed our daughter. We went out to the car and had blinders in the back seat, so she could have some privacy and keep the baby from distractions. I turned on the heater, locked the doors, and went back inside to help a buddy sell during a busier point. Only 10 to 15 minutes later, my phone starts frantically ringing with my wife on the other end. About three minutes before, I had noticed law enforcement had gotten up and walked outside the show, but I hadn't made the connection at that time. It took a minute to calm her down, but apparently that man had followed us outside and had been watching her very closely. While in the car, my wife got that sudden feeling. You know, that one that makes your hair stand up on end. That's when she saw a shadow standing outside her door, blocking it from opening, holding a small metal tube. At that same moment, a sheriff pulled up, who had also seen us go to the car. The officer approached the man and asked him what was going on. The man tried to say he was talking to my wife, who rolled the window down slightly and said she didn't even know him. The officer asked his name, but when he tried to turn around and run the name through his system, the man tried to run away. Obviously, the man was fake. Once they detained him, he gave his real name. Within one minute of calling it in, the man was turned around and immediately arrested. Turned out he had felony warrants out for kidnappings. The man was waiting for the nearby cars to leave. He wanted to try and take my wife and infant daughter. Had that cop not been right there at that exact moment, who knows how this could have all unfolded. Luckily, there was a cop exactly when we needed one. This is going to be a slightly long story, so please bear with me. This is from my sophomore year of high school. Keep in mind that some of the reasons why this whole scenario lasted so long were because I was extremely shy and I was having problems with extreme anxiety as well. One thing I did get out of this whole experience was that it helped me learn to speak up for myself, though. It was the beginning of the school year. I had a gym class as my first period. I went to class normally for a few days, 
but I had noticed at some point that this girl had been staring at me on and off. I really didn't think it was too much to worry about at first. A big mistake on my part. One day before class started, we were all hanging out in one corner of the gym, listening to our teacher's story about how he tripped and fell into a huge puddle of mud and was sitting on a pile of yoga mats, staring off into space, but still somewhat paying attention. I then heard a girl's voice say, Teacher, I have a story to tell too. I finally found my best friend I haven't seen in years, and she doesn't even recognize me. I snapped out of my staring spell and looked toward the voice to find that she was pointing directly at me. Since I was caught off guard, I foolishly said, Oh, no, no, I remember you. I read off the name that was written across her gym shirt, Ellie, because I didn't want to seem like a jerk for not remembering who she was. Ellie instantly brightened up that I remembered her and proceeded to lift herself up onto the yoga mats and sit uncomfortably close to me, close enough that our entire bodies were squished together. I didn't say anything because I didn't feel it was necessary to cause a huge problem out of this. Obviously, something was up with her mentally, and I didn't want to be a dick about that. Class went on, and Ellie and I were not in the same group anyway, so I really didn't have that much of a problem with her that day. The next few days, though, we didn't have any assigned class groups, so Ellie was trailing behind me like a dog. She was starting to get extremely protective and forceful with me. I don't get cold very easily, but she kept insisting I wear her jacket and would not leave me alone until I did so. She started to say things about hurting my actual friends, too, which was the final straw for me. Do whatever you want to me, but as soon as you bring my friends into it, I'm going to do something about it. I was finally going to bring all this up to our principal. Putting that whole thing behind us, though, our class today had the option of either volleyball or walking around the perimeter of the room. I decided to just walk around the room, and I've been doing that for around 15 minutes, until I sat on the ground by the bleachers to tie my shoes. Ellie dropped down out of nowhere and watched me with extreme interest. All of a sudden, she grabbed my wrist and held our forearms together. Look, look, see, we have the same veins. You want to know why? Because we were in the womb together. I used to hug you when you were scared in the womb, she said. This line freaked me out a lot at the time. One, our veins looked nothing alike, and two, we looked nothing alike either. She was a whole year older than me. I decided to run off to the bathroom before I really freaked out. I stayed in there for almost the rest of class. I did return later for the end of class roll call, and then left to go to the locker room. Ellie apparently got dressed super quickly, because I could see her hiding around the corner just staring at me half naked getting dressed. It made me really uncomfortable. I lied and told her I had to leave quickly, because I had to meet up with my boss at Olive Garden. I hightailed it out of there to my next class. My next class teacher, who I trusted dearly, had called me up to talk to her privately after class. She said Ellie had been talking about me and asking about me non-stop in the class she had her in. She recommended me to go to the police as soon as possible and told me she would talk to the principal. This scared the shit out of me. Just what in the hell had my teacher heard in that time from Ellie that she would tell me to go to the police of all people? I called my mom and skipped the rest of the day. I stayed home the next day as well and went to the police station with my mom. They brought us into a room and I started off with just telling them the basic story of what was going on. I hadn't even said her name yet. The guy I was talking to just stopped me and said, Ellie Smith? I was dumbfounded. How exactly did he know precisely who I was talking about? He went on talking about how she'd been down to the station a lot. He couldn't go into the specifics because she was a minor, though. Obviously, this did not help with my anxiety. Just what the hell had she done that she had to be called down to the station multiple times? The police couldn't really do anything, so the only thing I could do was switch my class. I was pissed off because I'd made a few good friends in that class, and I had to restart with a whole new one. At least now, I would be away from Ellie, though. The new class started off fine. But over the course of the year, I started to run into Ellie in the halls constantly. My friend had even seen her turn around at one point when I wasn't looking, 
and stare at me with one of those terrifying faces that give you chills. She would start to yell things along the lines of, I'm going to get you. This was extremely unnerving, of course. I didn't want her near me or my friends. I began stepping up and telling the vice principal directly whenever one of these instances occurred. She continued to stalk me over the course of my entire sophomore year. I was hoping she would forget about me, because I had figured out we had never actually met before that gym class. I had never hung out with anyone other than my friend Paige in the time Ellie said we were best friends. I even checked all my yearbooks, and not a single one mentioned an Ellie Smith. The morning of the first day of junior year, I ran into her before I even started my first class. I tried my best not to make eye contact. Later that day, the principal called me in and told me that Ellie said I had done a lot of things which I didn't. I hadn't even had the courage to look at her. This began a whole game with threats and random incoherent screeches that continued throughout my junior year. I felt like an entire part of the high school experience had been taken away from me because I spent so much time trying to figure out how to avoid this girl. Thankfully, because she was older than me, she graduated earlier and was gone during my senior year. This whole experience has honestly both traumatized me and helped me grow as a person, though. I learned how to assert myself more than I've ever done before. But I swear, sometimes when I'm out and around, I feel like I see her out of the corner of my eye, or like she's watching me from somewhere. It's caused some paranoia that still hasn't gone away completely. Oh, also, I've forgotten to put that at one point she had my phone number I gave her, when I didn't think anything was wrong yet. I apparently wrote down the wrong number, thank God, and she tried to call me like a hundred times. She got very angry and kept repeating she was going to stab me if I ever did that again when I saw her in class the next day. So two years ago, right around the time of Halloween, I was babysitting for these two ladies who each had a son. They wanted to go out that night, so I stayed at one of their houses and offered to watch their boys for them. It was around 8pm or so, and the boys were sitting on the couch playing with their iPads or whatever. At this exact moment, somebody knocked on the door. I asked both of them if anybody was supposed to come over, and they both said no. I crept over to the door and checked the eye hole. I could see some guy in a gray hoodie, deliberately hunched over so I couldn't see his face. Immediately I was sketched out and didn't say a single thing. I started pacing around because I didn't want to give him any inclination we were inside. A couple of minutes later I check outside the little window through the curtains just to make sure and I see he's gone now. I didn't want to spook the kids anymore and there weren't any other knocks either, so I kind of just let it go as a prank at first. Cut to a few hours later, and the moms get back. They ask me how everything was, and I say the kids were great, but some person had come to the door during that time. They ask me what time they came. I say around 8, and one of the moms starts freaking out, going through her phone. The other one tells me that right around that time... Somebody had begun making strange phone calls to them from a blocked number. They had disguised their voice and were saying things like, I can see you through your window right now. They didn't think it was serious because it didn't make sense in the context of where they were. But in retrospect, we were almost positive it was me he was looking at through the window that entire time. They escorted me to my car and I touched base later. Apparently, nothing strange ever happened after that either. I'm really glad I didn't decide to open the door to see what that guy wanted, because I have a gut feeling it would have been really, really bad. To start off, I'm a 16-year-old female. Okay, so I was visiting my mom's apartment for the weekend with my sister. We go there every weekend or every other weekend to see her. We arrived at about 10 in the morning this day and brought in our pillows and movies or whatever from my grandma's car. We got inside and chilled there together for a couple of hours, watching TV, before my sister said she was hungry. 
All right, what do you want? My mom asked. Pizza was the answer. I said I was okay with having pizza as well. My mom said she would have to run over to Kroger's, which was less than a mile or so away. She also said she would like to get some movies from Redbox as well. My sister asked if she could go with my mom down to the Kroger's. My mom agreed and asked if I would be fine in the apartment all by myself. I said I would because I was mature enough to be on my own. I'll be gone 20 minutes tops, my mom said. She really didn't like leaving me alone, but she thought it would be fine. It wasn't going to be for that long after all. Now, my mom's apartment is kind of in a crappy neighborhood. The kind of crappy where sex trafficking people have been spotted, drug dealers, thieves, that kind of stuff. I was on the third floor though of one of many surrounding apartment buildings, with tons of neighbors around at the time. I was sure it would be fine. Okay, sweetie, lock the door and don't open it unless it's me. You know, the standard stuff. They left soon after that and I was sitting there on the couch, on my phone with Jerry Springer playing in the background. It was about ten minutes after they had left, when I heard the doorknob begin to jiggle. I looked up, not feeling scared right away, but also feeling a little bit wary. I should mention I carry a pocket knife everywhere with me, and the blade is about three to four inches long. It was sitting there on the coffee table in front of me, when I got up to go to the door. I'm only five foot three, and I knew not to open the door for this person. So instead, I grabbed a chair and stood on top of it to look through the peephole. That's when I nearly shit my pants. On the other side was some random Mexican guy I had never seen before, just standing there trying to open the door. Of course, being how I am, I tried to laugh myself out of being afraid. I had no reason to think this man was going to do something to me. I mean, maybe he had just stumbled upon the wrong apartment or something. I had never seen this man before, and I didn't know everyone in the building personally, but I'd seen all of them at least once, and this guy I knew did not live there. Hey, man, I think you got the wrong room, I called out through the door. He froze immediately, his eyes glued to the door handle. Then he looked up at the peephole. He could probably tell exactly where I was when I spoke. I swear we made eye contact. The whites of his eyes were so yellow I thought he must have had jaundice. All of a sudden, he started ramming his shoulder into the door, like full-on shoulder ramming in football. I jumped off the chair and grabbed my phone and knife and ran into a room with a window to lock the door. I called my mom's friend who lived in the apartment building across the street and started crying hysterically into the phone. Jess, someone's trying to break in. Call the cops. Bring Chris. Get over here quick! She didn't even hesitate. Within seconds of hanging up, I called my mom as well. The guy was still slamming on the door, yelling in frustration now that he couldn't get it open. My mom picked up after a few rings. I told her what I had told her friend, and that her friend was coming with Chris and she needed to get here quick too. All she said was, I'm coming. By the time I saw Jess make her way down two flights of stairs and across the road with her boyfriend, my mom was flying down the road. Everyone there within mere seconds of me calling. They all raced inside, and I could hear shouting and yelling in the hallway. I unlocked the door and peeked out to see what was happening. I saw Chris holding the man against the wall, while my mom hugged me. Jess was screaming at the man as well. Long story short, the police arrived and took my statement. The man first denied everything by saying, I thought it was my room. He ended up confessing, though, that he'd seen me around before and wanted to come talk to me because he thought I was so pretty. The police officers had him in handcuffs and ran a background check on him, and what came up was not surprising. He had a warrant out for an assault charge on a woman, and had been arrested for child molestation and kidnapping as well. Yeah, we didn't exactly sleep well that night. This is a fresh brand new story, as it just happened yesterday. So, I was on my way back home from the city center at around 9 or 10 p.m., and I had this sandwich with me. I have to take this bus to get home with maybe 16 stops until I reach mine. My stop is not exactly a busy stop, 
Usually it's only me and sometimes one other person who gets off there. I hopped onto the bus at the back door, and the minute I sat down, this drunk guy came up to me and asked if I speak Hungarian. There are relatively a lot of beggars around this area, so I wasn't exactly surprised. I said no, a lie, so I could avoid further conversation. He then started speaking to me in English though, and asked if I could give him some money for food. I told him no, and that I didn't have any Hungarian currency on me right now. Again, a lie because I just wanted to eat my sandwich in peace. This guy then proceeded to demand I give him a piece of my sandwich and almost broke one off himself. I said to the dude, Sorry dude, no offense, but I just want to eat my stuff in peace. Please leave me alone. At first, he seemed pretty chill about it, but this is when it got interesting. He sat back down in his seat about three seats behind me, and I noticed immediately he was not alone. He was with two equally drunk other gentlemen. The bus now closed its doors and started on its trip. As I was sitting there eating my sandwich, I can hear these guys talking shit about me in Hungarian, assuming I didn't understand it. It was shit like, man, this dickhead won't even give me a piece of his sandwich. What a prick. Dude, I want to bash his head in with a glass. I'm so angry. I could hear them agree on getting out at my stop so they could beat me to death. I had never had to deal with a situation like this before, so I started to think of what I could do. I came to the conclusion that my best option was to get out at my stop and run home, but not down the usual route. I thought I could pretty easily outrun three 30-year-old extremely drunk guys. Meanwhile, because I was focused on what to do, I didn't even touch the rest of my sandwich. This got them even angrier though. Dude, look, this guy didn't even finish his sandwich. I bet he gets home and just throws the rest in the trash. Then one of them said he murdered someone in one of his dreams. The other one said he dreamt the same thing too, and this must not be a coincidence. I wanted to believe that surely they couldn't be that barbaric over a simple sandwich, but I was wrong. I heard them discussing my height, my weight, my buffness. They all came to the agreement that they could easily take me three on one. At this point, I was sweating. I was thinking about other options, because my stop was very quickly coming up. We were heading into the suburbs, and the bus was starting to get empty. Then I realized I could just pretend to get off somewhere else, and hope they got off too when I decided to do that. At the last relatively busy stop before mine, I stood up and went to the front door, where four other people stood waiting to get off. The bus stopped and I started to head towards there, but stopped when they couldn't see me anymore. Surprise, surprise, they got off thinking I had done so as well. The men then started walking back over to where I was standing calmly, because there were other people at the stop as well. When they got to my door though, luckily it closed shut. When we finally arrived at my actual stop, I checked to make sure that nobody else got off with me. I think this could have gone so much worse. I was lucky to get the best case scenario. And yes, I did eat the rest of the sandwich once I got home safely. I've always wanted to share this with other people, but I could never quite find the right place. For reference, at the time this all began, I was 14 and a freshman in high school. This was back in 2008 or 2009, so not particularly recent. It all began during the first couple of weeks of school. I went to this school district all my life, and I'd never had any real issues. I had no enemies really, only friends. It all began one Friday afternoon after school. I was hanging out with friends outside of the school until my mom came to pick me up. I decided to go upstairs to my locker and put a textbook away that I was originally going to bring home for the weekend. When I got up to it though, I noticed there was a note taped onto it. My name was written on it with a heart surrounding it. I read the contents of this note. It was a love letter signed by your secret admirer. I thought it was a friend playing a prank. I laughed it off and tossed it in the trash. When I confronted my friends downstairs though, they denied that they'd put a note on my locker and insisted it probably was actually from a boy who liked me. 
I didn't know what to think, really, but I did think of a few cute guys I went to school with. I hoped it was from one of them, but I sighed and thought it could have been almost anyone. Most likely, none of them. Two months went by since this day. During that time, we'd had a school picture day, and my mom had ordered some. They were eventually given to us during one of our classes. I kept them in my locker so I wouldn't lose track of them. It was a Friday night, and I was going to stay after school with friends again and hang around until the high school football game was over later in the evening. I waited until about two hours after school ended or so to grab my belongings out of my locker, including those photos. I put them in my backpack and headed on outside. I hung out around the football field with my friends until people started showing up for the game. At that point, we walked around or sat in the grass and talked for the rest of the evening. When I got home that night, I gave my mom the collection of photos when she noticed that one of the wallet-sized ones appeared to have been cut off from the rest. I had never bothered to look at all of them, so I hadn't been aware this was the case. I told her it really wasn't me that had cut one of them off, but she really didn't believe me. I didn't know what to think. A few weeks went by and I all but forgot about this missing photo. I did find another note taped onto my locker though, and this time one of my school photos was in it with a heart drawn around my head. A wallet-sized photo. The note made mention of how beautiful I looked during the game, sitting with my friends in the grass talking and laughing. Now I was uncomfortable. Whoever was doing this had stolen one of my photos, either out of my locker during school, which meant they had my combination somehow, or while I had left my backpack unattended during the football game. Once again, I assumed it was one of my friends just playing a prank on me. I didn't say anything about it. It had been several months since the last note, after all. Things took a rather stressful turn the following week, though. I was at home after school one day alone, while my mom was working a double shift, when someone came knocking on my front door. Thinking it was a pesky neighbor, I took my sweet time to answer it and opened up the door, only to find nobody there. I looked around outside, but I couldn't see anything but other mobile homes and neighbors' cars. I shut the door and resumed what I was doing. I heard the knocking again about ten minutes later. I took my time again to answer it and found Mike, one of our only friendly male neighbors. He was standing there with his Boston Terrier on a leash. He asked me if I had somebody over, which of course I did not. He then told me he had seen somebody snooping around my home a few minutes ago. I felt uncomfortable. I asked him who the person was, but he said he had never seen him around before. I thanked him and locked all my doors and windows after he left. The next month was full of incidents, where our motion sensor backlight would come on in the evening. It was capped off by my mom calling the police after she found a dead rabbit nailed to our back porch in a rather cruel fashion. Now, at the time, I would never have imagined that those notes, the snooping around, and now this dead rabbit were the work of someone who had been stalking me in the shadows for months, but it all came into fruition the following day at school. This day, I found a final note taped to my locker. I could see there was a big bulge in it, and when I began to open it, the foot of a rabbit fell onto the floor in front of me. I shrieked in terror as a teacher came running up to me. I pointed out the bloodied rabbit's foot. He picked it up and asked where it had come from. I showed him the note, and we immediately went to the office and showed the vice principal what we found. Later in the day, I was called into the office and found my mom there with the principal and vice principal. It was there that I had to recount the events over the last couple of months for the first time to anyone and give the names of the students I thought may have been responsible. They asked me for any suspicious interactions I'd had through social media or in school, but I'd never noticed anyone that seemed off to me. They told me if anything were to happen again to let them know, and they'd get the police involved if my life appeared to be in danger. My mom had already contacted the state trooper who visited our home the previous night about the rabbit's foot being found in my locker at school, and how a student may have been involved in this incident. From that day onward, nothing else major happened. About halfway through my junior year, though, I noticed another love letter. This time, instead of it being written by hand, though, it was typed out and signed, Your Secret Admirer from Freshman Year. I had all but forgotten about what had happened during that time. I kept this note and gave it to the principal, 
who kept it as evidence in case things ever escalated again. But luckily, they never did. Nothing else ever happened afterwards. At least, nothing that was particularly obvious to me. I also never found out who had done all this in the end. My junior year of college, I moved into a large house with four people on the first floor, five on the second, and two people upstairs who we didn't really talk to. This house was very old, but it seemed normal enough at first glance, at least until I went down to the basement for the first time. There was this washing machine and dryer down there that never worked, so we had no real reason to ever go down there except for parties. The weirdest part of this room was towards the back of the basement. It was always locked, and it always gave me an overwhelming sense of fear any time I even got near it. Apparently, when my roommates had first moved in, that room was not locked. One of the girls had been looking around in there and found several human teeth and what she described as strange tools. Not too long after that, the landlord, who had only just recently purchased the property, locked up that door, and it had never been opened since. Fast forward a few months. I had recently woken up from a nap and was cooking some food on the stove. I was the only person there on our floor. Suddenly, the hallway light to my left turned off with no warning. I shrugged, assuming the light must have burnt out on its own. Then, though, it turned back on. The light switch for that light was on the stairwell on the other side of a closed door, so I waited for a minute, only for the light to turn off by itself again. I ran over to the door quickly and threw it open, thinking someone had to be fucking with me. But no one was there. I walked downstairs. There was nobody on that floor either. Now I was a little freaked out. I still just told myself though it must be an electrical problem or something. I go back to making my food. Immediately the light turns off and on again. I kind of stood there for a few seconds. Then music started to play. It was coming from the living room, which was right next to the kitchen, out of sight. Now I was feeling relieved, thinking someone must have been home after all. I walked out into the living room, only to see a closed laptop. Sitting on a ledge near the window, connected to some speakers, the television was on one of those static channels, just like in the movies. I slowly walked toward the speakers when I realized the laptop had been turned off. I unplugged them, and the music stopped. I really wish I could remember what song was playing, but I obviously had other thoughts in my mind in that moment. That was when the chills sunk in. I turned off the stove, walked down the stairs, got in my car, and drove away. A few weeks later, I told my roommates about what had happened hoping someone would confess to the very elaborate prank they had just pulled on me. Instead, though, every single person got kind of quiet, and each one, one by one, started admitting to weird shit that had happened to them, too. One of the girls claimed that she would often wake up in the middle of the night and hear noises coming from inside her closet. Sometimes, the hangers would move around like someone had just bumped into them. Another friend said he often heard weird noises, like footsteps above him. When he walked upstairs, though, nobody was home. Another guy told us he had woken up in the middle of the night to see a dark figure standing right in the center of our kitchen, staring into his room, before it walked into the stairwell and disappeared from his sight. A little late to the thread, so this might not get too many reads, but I'll post this anyways. So, when I was 7 or 8 years old, I went over to a friend's house after school. My friend's house was located on a relatively quiet street and had a large backyard surrounded by woods. Well, my friend and I decided it'd be a good day to build a tree fort. We'd build it out in the woods behind his house. We rounded up some of the necessary tools and brought his little brother to tag along as well. Some background to the story, there had recently been some daytime coyote spotting in the area, so we were nervous already to begin with. 
I even remember discussing with my friend and his younger brother our plan to smash any attacking coyotes with a hammer. In retrospect, that probably wouldn't have worked too well. But like I said, we were all very little kids. As we were walking along the path out into the woods, I can vividly remember looking down at the trail while walking and conversing with my friend, when all of a sudden my friend's younger brother stopped dead in his tracks and remained standing there motionless. Before I even knew what was going on, I noticed my friend also stop suddenly, so naturally I did the same. I looked up to see just what it was that was frightening them. I can still very clearly remember this image. I could see in the middle of the woods, there was this older woman, I'd guess mid to late 70s if we had to say an age. She had this waving curly grayish white hair and was dressed in a white gown. She was roughly 25 yards ahead of us, just standing there. She wasn't moving, completely motionless, not even looking at us, but rather directly through us, if that makes any sense. I still get the chills even thinking of that image now, but it's still so clear in my mind. What I'm about to say next might seem like a little bit of a stretch, and it was more than likely my imagination getting the better of me. However, I swore there was like a faint aura of white around the woman. My friends and I have also since discussed this incident, and they too described some sort of light radiating off of her. After standing paralyzed for what seemed like several moments, we watched as the woman slowly raised her right arm and pointed the direction in which we'd come and started walking slowly towards us. Almost immediately, just like a scene from a movie, we all screamed and dropped our tools, nails, and pieces of woods for the treehouse. We sprinted back towards my friend's house. All of us frantically told my friend's mom what we'd seen. But to no one's surprise, she just dismissed it as childhood imagination. We're all now over 20 years old, and we're still in agreement that we saw a glowing white-haired woman dressed in a white gown in the middle of the woods that day. Although it may not seem like it, this happened quite a while back, probably over 10 years ago now. I was in the later years of high school, and I was home alone on this particular day. My parents were away at a wedding that required them to stay at a hotel, and my brother worked the night shift. At that time, my family lived in a very well-known East Coast city in a blue-collar neighborhood. It was just starting to take a nosedive at the time. As a teenager, I was actually a little bit of a loner. I wasn't a nerd or anything like that, though. I was a big dude who had some friends and went on dates occasionally, but I was also a natural introvert. This meant I really cherished the rare alone time that I got to have. This weekend, I was really looking forward to engaging in my normal empty house routine. You know, play some PlayStation on the big screen TV, order a late takeout dinner, either pizza or Chinese, and pig out while watching some Dragon Ball Z. At around 2am, I fell asleep on the couch with my old dog Cecil. Cecil was a beagle as old as the hills themselves, and had been in our family for about 8 years altogether. He was a very quiet and peaceful dog, and spent his time begging for food and mostly sleeping. Unlike most beagles, Cecil never howled or barked. Instead, he was more than content to just rest his head on your lap and spend the entire night there. Anyway, back to the story. It's approximately 1 a.m. now. I had just finished the last slice of pizza and was dozing off on the couch when I hear a bang come from the back alleyway. Anyone who's ever lived in a big city knows that noises happen at all moments of the night. Cecil's head, though, immediately popped off of my lap, and the hair on his back stood straight up. He was always a bit skittish, so I calmed him down some and started to doze off again. No more than two minutes later, though, I hear another huge bang, and Cecil did something I'd never seen him do before. He took a soaring leap off the couch and ran like the wind towards the door leading to the basement, barking and growling like a dog twice his size. Honestly, the look on his face reminded me of the German Shepherd canine unit. 
I'd never seen him like that before, which immediately got my adrenaline pumping. Just barely, through my dog's persistent barking, I could now make out a banging noise that was constant. I remembered there was a seldom used door in the basement that led directly to our back alleyway. It was old and rusted, and hard to open even with a key. It also made a lot of noise. In that moment, I realized someone was now trying to break into my house through the basement door. A quick little bit of context for anyone who's never lived in a bad neighborhood before. If someone tries to get into your home, they move on immediately after they realize your door is shut tight, if they want your stuff. If someone is persistently trying to get into your house, despite the door being shut tight though, they're there for you. Knowing this, I rushed upstairs to grab the heavy wood baseball bat that I kept under my bed exactly for situations like this. I headed down to my basement. I probably should have run, but I was a macho teenager with a tough guy complex. Plus, it's not a... While I'm heading down the stairs to my basement, Cecil blows past me with the speed and aggression of a dog half his age. Suddenly, I hear a man's voice call out, Oh, fuck, damn it! The banging suddenly stopped. I didn't call the cops or anyone else after that, which was probably the dumbest thing I've ever done. Instead, I sat up for the rest of the night with a baseball bat in my hand. My brother came home that morning, and I told him everything that happened. We went to the basement door to take a look at its shape, but when we gave it a tug to open it, the entire door just fell right off. This psycho was only one good shove away from getting inside. But thank God old Cecil scared him off in time. I'm pretty sure that lazy fat old boy just saved my life. When I tell this story to people, they dismiss his actions as a dog doing what a dog is supposed to do. But when I tell you Cecil never barked or moved that fast in his life, you can take that all the way down to the bank. It was almost like he knew in that moment the urgency. Like he knew that door was about to give and I was going to be in danger. Unfortunately, a few years back, we had to have him put down. He was just too old with no will to live anymore. Before the injection, I got one last moment alone with him. I thanked him one last time for his friendship and for what he did for me that night. At this point, I was a grown man with a wife and kids. I'm convinced that none of that would have happened if Cecil wasn't with me that night. Thanks, pal. I really miss you. Back in the 80s, my Aunt Kay was in her early 20s or so. This was before she married my uncle, and when she would drive long distances back and forth between her parents and my uncles to visit. It was a transitional period for them. He had just graduated, and she hadn't moved out yet to be with him. It was a long drive across several states, through the desert as well. It took her many hours along the way. This desolate highway would have stretches of road that lasted hundreds of miles. Quite often, you wouldn't see a single other driver, let alone a gas station. So, Aunt Kay set out and began one of these journeys. A couple of hours into the drive, Aunt Kay noticed a dark vehicle slowly catching up behind her. She barely noticed at first as she continued to sing along to Les Miserables until the vehicle got aggressively close. She turned off the music and looked over into her rearview mirror, seeing the vehicle flash its brights and a hand pointing at her car motioning to pull over. Alarmed, she quickly slowed down and began to look for a good place to pull off the road. Something must be wrong with her car if this guy is doing this. The second she began to pull off the road, though, she said she felt and heard clear as day, don't pull over in her mind, and again even stronger. Don't pull over. Call it God, intuition, just a gut feeling, but a jolt of adrenaline and fear shot through her body as she slammed the gas and peeled out onto the highway. Heart pumping, Aunt Kay silently asked herself what the hell that was as she saw the vehicle peel out right behind her. The dark vehicle continued to follow closely, flashing their brights and motioning for her to pull over. Fear and confusion setting even further. 
Aunt Kay began to question just what was going on. Why was this driver motioning so hard for her to pull over? There must be something wrong with her car, right? But then what the hell was that warning she'd just felt from her instincts? It would have been a severe situation if her car broke down out there, especially before the time of cell phones. But instead, she pressed on. Just as her resolve started to waver, she began questioning if she truly did feel what she just felt. She started slowing back down. When the dark vehicle began to pick up speed, it entered into the oncoming traffic lane and came level to my aunt's car. The driver smiled, motioned, and pointed. He mouthed the words pull over to my aunt through the window. She said in the moment she looked into his eyes, she could feel this guy was evil. She described this horribly sick feeling in the pit of her stomach and again heard the words come to her head, don't pull over. He was described as a greasy, scary-looking man who was missing a couple of teeth in his smile. She'll never forget that smile that sent chills through her that night. This quickly dispelled any thought she had of pulling over. Instead, she put the pedal to the metal to try and lose him. He chased after her. She slowed down, he slowed down. She would speed up. He'd speed up right on point. It got to the point where he began to try to push her car off the road. Now she was on the verge of tears as this creep continued to terrorize her all alone, stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. Finally, after what felt like an eternity of chasing, Aunt Kay saw a couple of semis off in the distance. She felt if only she could get close, or even in between those trucks, she would now be safe. She slammed on the gas. He continued to flash his lights, honk his horn, and try to smash into her car until she got close enough to those trucks. As she moved in between them, she saw the dark vehicle slow way down and eventually disappear completely from view. She stayed with those trucks for a couple of hours until she felt safe enough to pull over into a gas station at an exit and cry. Fast forward several years later, my aunt and uncle were now married. He's working at a law firm as a high-profile criminal prosecutor in Las Vegas. She was now a full-time mom of several young children. Now, since I've known my aunt, she's been obsessed with true crime. Dateline, 2020, unsolved mysteries, forensic files, these were always playing at their house non-stop, and this day was no different. She was there folding laundry in the kitchen, while listening to the TV in the other room. The interviewer was talking about a man who was now being interviewed on death row, as she idly paired another match of socks, she heard the man describe one of his tactics for procuring victims. According to him, he would wait along the side of the highway. A car would go by with a family and he'd wait. Another car with a male driver would go by. He'd still wait. But every now and then, a car would go by with a pretty young woman driving all alone. So he'd pull out behind him and follow them. Flash his brights, honk, and motion for him to pull over. Aunt Kay, paralyzed, continued to listen. You know, when they eventually would pull over, I'd tell them to pop the hood, and I'd be able to tell them what was wrong with their car. They would, and I'd yank a couple of random wires. When the car wouldn't start after that, I'd tell them, you know, no problems, my buddy has a shop in the next town over. I can give you a ride, and he'll give you a real fair deal. My aunt slowly moved to the living room. They'd get in, and I'd be up and kill him, you know bury them anywhere out in the desert. It's not like they'd ever find all the bodies. I mean, I can't even count myself. When asked how many times he did this, he responded he had no idea. And how many got away? Two or three. My aunt stood alone, staring into the same toothless grin she'd seen on the highway that day. It was Henry Lee Lucas. Way back when, I had this summer job when I was a 15-year-old girl that was a few miles or so away from my house. I lived in a very rural, wooded area, and my parents never let me go into the woods by myself. They worked days, though, and my job started at noon every day, so I had to walk to work. During this time, I chose to disobey them and walk through the woods instead of on the road. 
Walking this way to work would cut about a half mile off my walk altogether. So every day at around the same time, I'd walk through a very much abandoned state forest, down a deer path for about a mile or so. At the point it intersected a railroad track, I'd then walk a couple more miles down those tracks into town to my job. Stupid, I know, but I was 15 years old. Taking this path always freaked me out a lot, and I would always feel like I was being watched. It was shorter though, less sunny, and less hot as well, so I ignored my instincts, thinking my parents' influence must just be making me paranoid. My parents would pick me up every day after my shift, unaware of this daily routine. This continued on for weeks and weeks. One day though, I'm out walking about a mile away from any houses, very deep into the woods. I see there are now two porn magazine pages that have been ripped out and placed on the trail facing me. They hadn't been there the day before. I was completely creeped out, as these were clearly intentionally placed, probably for me, since I didn't know anyone else who utilized this area. I kept walking though. If I turned around at this point, I'd have further to go to get out of the woods. Then there was a huge hill to climb to get back to my house as well. No one would be around there to help me anyway. This particular section was a densely wooded area with brambles and dogwood, rolling hills as well, so I couldn't see particularly far in any direction. Suddenly, I could hear someone else walking close by. I stopped in my tracks. I would hear them for a split second, and then they would stop when I stopped as well. As I listened even more closely, I could hear what sounded like change in their pocket. I knew it was not an animal. Because of the echo of the surroundings though, I couldn't pinpoint exactly where this noise was coming from. Just to check that I was not crazy, I stopped once more. I heard the exact same noise in the silence of the forest, which quickly stopped when I stopped as well. Now I knew I was being followed. My heart was racing with fear. My vision went blurry. But my instincts told me not to speak out, not to run, just keep walking down this dense deer path further out into the woods. My gut also told me not to look behind me no matter what. I could sense there was someone right behind me now on the deer path, but I didn't dare to look back. I'm a rather short chubby person and always have been. Looking at me, you'd probably assume I can't run very fast. So, if you wanted to catch me deep in the woods, you might assume you had a lot of time to do so. Looking back, I think that's exactly what this creep was thinking. But, you see, back then, even though I was a little bit chubby, I ran cross-country and track, and could run a seven-minute mile. Hills, particularly, were my specialty. I had always placed really well in the hilly terrain competitions. By no means was I the best runner or even a great runner but I was certainly likely faster than whatever out-of-shape pedo creep was hanging out in the woods stalking a little girl. It's not that I was processing this thought at the time. I just instinctively knew it was not time to run. At least, not yet. I kept on walking seemingly deeper into the woods because I knew the train track was just up ahead. There would be more space to run without tripping or getting caught in all these branches and brambles. It was terrifying, not looking back a single time, but something kept telling me not to. While I walked, I felt like my entire body was shutting down. It's a feeling I've never felt before or after that day. The feeling of being prey. Everything went blurry. I could feel the blood pulsing in my ears and my heart was pounding like crazy. I just kept walking like nothing was happening. I did not turn around but I could now feel someone five feet behind me, following me for a good eighth of a mile. I didn't turn around still. I didn't scream because I knew no one would be there to hear me. As soon as I got near to the gravel tracks, which were elevated along a man-made gravel mound, I began to sprint. I ran on all fours up that hill, gripping on weeds to pull myself up faster. I sprinted along the tracks as fast as my lungs and legs would carry me. I could hear and see branches snapping below me in the woods, but now I was out in the sun. The woods were dark so I couldn't see what was hidden behind those branches. 
Instead, I kept on sprinting. I never even saw who was chasing me, but I knew their intentions must be awful. After that, I never cut through those woods again. I didn't mention what happened to my parents until I was 18 and had moved out of the house. I was too afraid of being put in trouble or grounded. I'm what I would most certainly call a creep magnet. I get weirdos all the time. It's actually become sort of a joke I share with my friends and co-workers, telling them one of the many, oh so many, creepers I've encountered in my time as a retail employee. Naturally, you get all kinds of people coming into your store. I'm well known for my very bright attitude and overly chipper way of being, which has come to be loved by many regulars and newcomers alike. It's also, more than likely, a contributing factor as to why I get so many weirdos. I'd also imagine my height as well. I'm very short, standing at only 4 foot 8, and looking about 5 years younger than my actual age of 21. I'm also rather filled out for how young I look, so I guess that's another reason as well. On to this story though. This day was like any other. Just another ordinary day working by myself in the store. Checking out customers, stocking shelves in my moments away from the register. A very average day. At some point while on the register though, I greeted a man with a large dark beard, bald and wearing glasses, as he came through the door. He immediately smiled and got this surprised look on his face. The one I've now come to know as the, oh shoot, I'm totally gonna creep on this girl today look. No biggie, I was used to it. I knew how to handle myself and brush it off. Eventually, after an hour or two of being on register, I'd pretty much cleaned out the store of my customers and moved out to stocking candy. The man before with the beard approached me with a smile and held up a large white trash can. Um, excuse me. Yeah? I replied, glancing up from the box I was currently stocking. Are there any more of these in the back? This one doesn't seem to have a lid, he said, gesturing to the large trash can in his hand. Oh, yeah, is that all? I can go and check that for you if you'd like. I smiled and was very polite like I always was with customers. I turned away and headed off to the stock room to search for the item for him. I noticed that now he was following me, but I didn't think too much of it. I glanced down the aisles looking for any other customers as I walked down. Immediately though, I took note of the store's sheer emptiness. Well shit, I guess it's only us two in the store, I thought to myself. I moved through the stock room door. I was quickly relieved when this guy stopped at the employee's only entrance. Just wait right there, I'll be right back, I said as I made a turn around some full roll tainers, which due to just receiving a truck, our stock room was full of them. They stood very tall and were basically like giant movable walls. Very, very heavy, mind you. Being so small, I couldn't really move them much to make a path through and see what was on them. After only a minute or so, I'd managed to find myself a little path, though, having three heavy ones on my right and left and one in front of me. I decided to give up on my search for the trash cans and this maze of things. Sighing, I went to turn around and sadly inform him of my defeat only to find he was right there. He was now blocking my tiny path of walls, a very tight squeeze for a man of his stature. He was standing directly behind me. He leaned in to whisper to me, You find him? Uh, no, I, I don't think we have any. I tried to laugh and avoid acknowledging just how creepy this was, but I was very aware of my surroundings now. I was trapped in this small area, with walls at my back and sides towering over myself. This large man was standing in the way of my only exit, in a room very far from any other people. No cameras, no other employees in the store. I was helpless. I was increasingly growing scared at how this man was moving closer, and not moving to let me out. I went to voice to him that I needed to return to work after a solid minute went by of him standing there blocking me but I was not able to get out a single word. He said in a creepy, almost shy kind of voice, You're just the cutest little thing. Do you know that? 
Within an instant, I could feel the ill intention from this guy. Oh my god, this is how I die, I thought to myself. Surprising myself, though, I choked out without thinking. I, I think I just heard my bell. What? He looked confused and didn't budge a single inch. I just heard my bell. There are people up front who need to be checked out and are looking for me right now. I stood there nervously, knowing full well neither of us had heard the familiar ching from the service bell I keep on the register. But what about my items? He asked, stepping right in front of me. He took a glance back toward the trash can. Again, with my lightning thinking, I blurted out, I'll mark it down half price. No big deal. I laughed, trying to act like nothing was out of the ordinary. It seemed he was caught off guard by this. I slipped by him, seeing my opening at his turning around. I tried my hardest to walk away, pretending to be calm as I exited that room. I then sprinted to the front of the store the moment I was out of sight. Of course, after that, he left without even staying to purchase a single thing. So this happened around nine years ago when I was 11 or so. Changed all the names, of course, but this is certainly fucked up. There was this girl at school named Amy who really didn't have very many friends. She was very quiet and honestly I thought she was a bit strange. I felt though like it would be nice to befriend her. So we started talking and she actually turned out to be really nice. We became best of friends rather quickly. It got to the point even where I'd spend every weekend at her house. We would even walk to school together in the morning. Even at my young age though, I could tell right away that there was something weird about her dad, Kevin. He was very interested in me it seems. Always tried to play fight and stuff, which is weird in and of itself. Whenever he was around, I would just feel like something was wrong. He was a short fat man with gray and white hair. He always had this weird smirk on his face and really wide eyes, too. It started off with stealing bits of my food whenever I wasn't looking, then laughing and making sure to put his arms around my shoulders to apologize. He'd always show up wherever we were, upstairs, downstairs, in the garden. He'd always be lurking around somewhere whenever I was over. I remember there was this day that Amy's non was visiting, Amy's mother's mom and Kevin just kissed her non right on the mouth hello. It was so weird, but then it turned into the creepiest, sloppiest French kiss right in front of us. Everyone except me and Amy found it very funny. She put on this forced smile when her family looked over, but I was completely horrified. Maybe I shouldn't have gone back after that, but I felt like I had to, for Amy. After that, there was this day where we were playing in her room, Kevin came in and started up an argument over nothing. It got so heated he grabbed rubbish bags, saying he was going to throw away all of her belongings. Of course, an 11-year-old is going to go furious if they think their dolls and everything are going to be thrown away. She was hysterical. We followed him downstairs, where he turned around and told her in the most serious voice that if she ever spoke to him like that again, she would regret it. It was then that he started to remove his belt. What the fuck? She immediately pushed me toward their front door, which was just in front of the stairs. She was sort of half laughing, forcing a smile, as she tried to convince me this was no big deal, but I could tell it would be as soon as I left. I got out the door, but when I turned around and waited, Kevin slammed it shut hard. All I could hear after that was Amy screaming at the top of her lungs, I was so scared. I didn't know what to do, but I didn't want to just leave her, so I stood there. Eventually, I found the courage to sneak my way back in. I went upstairs to Amy, who was now brushing her doll's hair. She smiled at me, but she had this tear-stained face that was so miserable. There were no visible marks at all. It seemed he could have hit her anywhere. I then felt as if I had to protect Amy from now on. So I continued going there and didn't tell my mom a thing. One night I woke up thirsty, and we were close enough for me to just go get a drink myself. When I went downstairs, Kevin was laying there, on the floor in the dark. He was wearing nothing but tidy whities and he stared up at me, still awake. It was the creepiest thing I had ever seen. 
Only the street lamp from outside shining through a gap in the blind lit up the room just enough to see him there. Needless to say, I did not get myself a drink. Instead, I ran back upstairs and shut the door. I wouldn't go there after that until I knew for sure he would not be there, and I didn't sleep over any more after. I'm not sure, but I think if I ever told my mom, she'd go and kill him right away. I was talking to Amy recently, actually. She opened up to me because she sent me her mental health assessment sheet. She told me when she was 10 she had woken up to Kevin being her 15-year-old sister. Kevin was not her sister's dad, not that it makes it any better at all. She was screaming for Amy for help. It also stated he would regularly beat Amy as well. The most recent incident was two years ago. He beat her right in front of a friend, and her friend called the police. I told her all of the things I'd seen back in the day and how I knew something wasn't right. All I know of him now is that he's in the hospital, suffering with COPD, and I really, really don't give a fuck. Also, her mom knew this was happening, but didn't do a single thing about it either. More than a few years ago, I was working as a burlesque entertainer in a gentleman's club and was idly sitting at the end of the bar one night when this couple came in. Not exactly unusual. I had no contact with them and thought nothing of their being there. Until later. A few days after that night, the doorman handed me a piece of paper that had two names and phone numbers written down on it. Laura and Richard. I was supposed to call one of them or something. So I called up Laura, who told me they had been the couple who had been at the bar the other night. They said they'd noticed me and thought I would be perfect for a part in a movie Richard was now producing. Would I be up for a meeting, perhaps? Of course I would. Who wouldn't? I was told Richard would pick me up the next night at 7 and to wear something wild. 7 o'clock came by the next evening. I was ready in a white lace dress with an ostrich feather trim when Richard showed up outside my building. I went down, introduced myself, and got into the car. We agreed to go to a local bar I knew very well for the meeting. First, though, we had to go back to his place so he could pick up some contracts he'd forgotten. Off we went. He disappeared inside the house and came back out holding a few manila envelopes and an open bottle of beer, a brand I didn't drink, mind you. Plus, it was against the law to drink alcohol in a vehicle here. I stuck the beer into the window well of his jeep, and we went off to the bar. When we arrived, he showed me what were supposedly scripts from this movie he was producing. Some contracts. Honestly, it looked pretty legit. Richard was also very nice and polite as well, and I was interested in doing this role. I'd made some plans to go out later with my soon-to-be boyfriend, so I excused myself to go call him on the bar's payphone. I took the Corona I'd ordered at the bar with me to the bank of phones. As a dancer, I'd been taught by the other older girls to never ever let your drink out of your sight. My boyfriend wanted to get going to another club, so I went back to the table where Richard was at. I told him I had to go. Well, he didn't like that, did he? He tried a few different things to get me to go to the movie set with him immediately, saying I could meet Mickey Rourke, check out the set, but all I really wanted to do was spend some time with my boyfriend. I declined, took Richard's card, and left. I never heard from Richard again after that, but a couple of months later, I did hear from the police when they came around to the bar I was working at. They pulled out these two gigantic books of mugshots with a stack of Polaroids as well. They said they wanted to talk to all of us about this predator couple who had been setting up meetings with dancers by saying they were in the film industry, then drugging them, beer-ripping them, and attacking them. They showed me these two mugshot books and asked if anyone I recognized was in the pictures. Well, immediately, I identified Richard and Laura. They showed me the Polaroids, which were all trophy pictures of the couple in the act of attacking these poor drugged-up girls. They asked if anyone knew any of the victims and where they might find them in order to talk to them. I only knew a couple of the women in the photographs, but there were a lot this had happened to. Richard and Laura were thoroughly prosecuted. He went to jail, but she did not. 
This is because she was from a wealthy family and also turned witness on him. About 12 years after Richard was convicted, I saw in the newspaper he was up for the possibility of parole. I wrote down a letter to the parole board telling this story and urging them not to ever let him back out. He was obviously a dangerous offender who should stay in prison for the entirety of his sentence. If I hadn't thought about it and drunk that open beer he had just off-handed to me in his jeep on the way to that meeting, I would never have made it to the meeting and I probably would have ended up in that stack of Polaroids. Girls and guys, always, always keep an eye on your drinks. Have fun, but make sure to be careful when you're out and about, okay? When I was seven and my sister was eight, we were allowed to go down the street to the park by ourselves, which was right down the street from my house and right next to a church as well. Because of this, we very frequently went, but we had to keep our eyes peeled for things specifically like broken beer bottles, used needles, that kind of dirt. Also, don't poke at the drunks in the bushes. We were also told to run if a black Lincoln town car came near asking us for help. Adults don't ask kids for help unless they want to grab them, you hear? I was pretty plucky for a poor kid. I didn't exactly live in a nice part of town. This particular day, we were crawling around in the bushes looking for drunk change. The nickels and dimes that would sometimes roll out of a really drunk person's pockets. They would add up if you could look around carefully. We wanted to go buy some cheap candy at the convenience store when all of a sudden... We heard a man's voice, coughing, crying, and what sounded like pleading for help. He was curled up beside the church. He couldn't have been too far into adulthood, but he was so slashed up, his face had almost no discernible features, except for the tears streaking through this mess of dried blood. He was covered all over in blood as well. He was shaking hard, begging the wall of the church to help him blue plaid flannel and really gunky black jeans, all over just black brown runnels of dried blood and small cuts all over as well, a particularly bad one going almost all the way through his leg. I'm guessing he had lost a lot of blood. He was absolutely wrecked. We went over and my older sister told me to stay there with him. She was going to try and get some help. Somehow, we managed to help get him to the front of the church, but it was midweek in the summer, so nobody was there. I sat there with this trembling, weeping young man, keeping my hands to myself. He was still oozing blood from cuts everywhere. I had to keep repeatedly telling him help was on the way. Well, my sister went home and forgot about me. The old woman in the divided house on the corner called the police because she recognized me but not the hunched-up mess I had helped get to the front door of the church. Eventually, the cops came by and told me to go home. The man was put into the back of a car. I don't know what happened to him in the end, but it didn't look good. I do know it was a local gang that did that to him. I figured this out from his garbles as he was constantly apologizing to invisible attackers. He was probably very deep into shock. We went to the park the next day and the hedges we had been crawling through just the day before had all been chopped down. Most of the lower limbs of the pine trees also got lopped off as well, so drunks and gang members couldn't hide in them at night anymore. That's the most sad, disturbing story I have in my childhood. I'd never seen an adult male cry or be so broken before or since. Gang violence really is terrifying. We never talked about this incident again but it took an entire week for them to get around to spraying the sheer amount of dried blood off of the building. It was extremely bad. I've shared this before elsewhere, but I figured I'd share it here as well. In high school, I used to hang out with my friend named John almost every day. When we first began hanging out at this house, I would sometimes hear disembodied footsteps every now and then. Very often, though, I would see what looked like a shadow of a person out of the corner of my eye. 
only to have it disappear moments later. After a month or so of this, I finally mentioned this to my friend. He got mad almost immediately and demanded to know who had told me he had seen these shadow people. He begged me to not joke around with him about something so serious. I assured him that it was no joke. Soon, we began to hear laughter when we knew no one else was home. Doors would shut by themselves, and the TV would turn itself on and off. One day, after these experiences had grown more and more intense and more frequent over time, I mentioned to my friend trying to bless the house. The instant this left my mouth, a box sitting on a nearby counter flew off the counter and almost smacked me in the head. It sounds completely unbelievable, but it was the single most terrifying experience of my life. My friend and I quickly grabbed up some holy water and sprinkled it around the house while saying a prayer. We never experienced anything in the house again. Months later, my friend came to stay at my lake house with me for a weekend. At one point in the night, we both thought we saw a shadow person, but we decided to pass it off as nothing. Later that night, though, we woke up to what sounded like voices emanating from the living room. He went to go investigate, thinking someone may have broken in, while I stayed put. A few moments later, I heard the sound of someone thundering down the hallway, I ran out to see why my friend was running, but he was not in the house. Instead, my friend was outside on the porch. He came inside, saying he'd heard that loud noise from the house too, and he thought it had been me. Nothing else happened for the rest of the weekend, but the next time I went to that house, after it had sat empty for about a week, a picture frame with my photo in it had been ripped off the wall and thrown down the hall. I also noticed all of the pillows from my couch were stacked on top of one another and in the very middle of the couch as well. I stopped hanging out with John after this, and I never really experienced anything of that sort again. I don't know if he was cursed or haunted or what, but it was so weird. This story happened in July. My husband and I decided to take our two kids camping one weekend, since we couldn't really do much else due to the coronavirus. Plus, we loved camping anyway, and had never taken the kids with us before. Our daughter is two, and our son is six years old. We went out to our usual place, where the campsites were about half a mile away from each other. Well, of course, once it started to get dark, our kids started getting quite scared. They wanted to leave, so we decided to take them to my dad's for the weekend. We went back to the campsite on our own around midnight or so. We decided it was now time to go to bed. We lay down and fell asleep rather quickly. Around an hour or two later, I woke up and had to pee. I woke my husband up as well. He got up and walked with me to the bathroom which was about halfway between the campsites. On our way back, though, we saw a light coming from our campsite. This kind of worried us, making us think maybe somebody was looking for us. We quickly walked back to the campsite, but right before we got out of the tree line, my husband threw his arm out to stop me. Hey, what are you... Shh. I stayed quiet and looked back at the campsite. I watched the light and that's when I saw a glint of silver in the person's hand. They were holding a long knife. We ducked down and hid behind some trees, and in typical scary movie fashion, the guy apparently heard us crouching down. He moved and shined his light towards the woods where we were. He started running, and we took off running in the opposite direction. We could hear him sprinting through the brush behind us. We kept checking behind to look, but now the light was gone. Eventually, we were able to circle back down to the road and crept slowly back to my husband's SUV. We both hopped in and drove away as fast as we could. We called the police as well. They had us take them back to the campsite, and we waited in the car while they checked everything out, the campsite and the surrounding area. Soon, we saw even more police cars pull up. The original two officers came up to us and asked us to walk over to the tent with them. We did so, and what we saw there was shocking. Our tent had been slashed apart to pieces, 
and so had all of our other stuff as well, quite meticulously. The police ended up evacuating all the other campers in the area. They did a sweep of the entire place, but they didn't find anything, except the flashlight, which had apparently been dropped along the way we ran. We follow up with the police every month since then, but there have been no new updates. I'll post more if anything ever comes up, but I'm not sure it will. My husband and I have always loved to go camping. We live in California and set aside two weeks every summer for a camping trip where we can just get away together and disconnect from the real world. Normally, we hit up Death Valley for some backcountry adventures for a few days, then head up into the mountains for some quality fishing. On the way home, we usually stop for one last hurrah and the Eastern Sierra. On this particular trip, my husband, myself, and our German shepherd Ginger were all there together. We ended up finding a lake to swim in for the day, and when we got tired of that, we decided to find a spot to camp. We were both fairly familiar with that area, and knew there was a free campground about 12 miles up the mountain. I never really liked that specific campground. It can get pretty cold at night because of the elevation, even in the summer. But whatever. It was free, right? And we had plenty of firewood with us. When we first pulled into the campground, there was only one tent pitched, but we couldn't see any people around at all. In fact, for the entire evening, there was not a single other person in sight. I kind of love it when the campground is so empty, and this was a pretty primitive and remote area. It was quite rare to even see people driving past. After we got all set up and the beer was flowing very freely, we got pretty trashed and hung out for a bit. We cooked a good dinner over the campfire and decided to hit the sack. My husband, Dog, and I were all sound asleep when we were suddenly awoken by this ungodly scream in the middle of the night. One of us grabbed the phone to see what time it was. Then my husband grabbed his gun and told me to stay there while he went out to see what was happening. Of course, I couldn't help but want to peek out as well. I could see there in the light of the moon. A guy was standing in front of the other tent that was set up across the scream, just staring into the sky and screaming. It was this loud, horrific, blood-curdling scream that was completely terrifying. Normally, seeing something like that might prompt a call to the police, but due to being so remote, the cell signal was non-existent. My husband didn't want to go over to confront the man for obvious reasons, so instead he came back to the tent with me and we stayed up for the rest of the night searching out while the man screamed. The next morning, we packed up and left as soon as we could. That same tent was still there, but once again, there was now nobody in sight. We actually drove past there many days later, out of curiosity. That same tent was still pitched in the same spot, but there were still no other campers around. This was about ten years ago. We visit the area frequently still since we now have a cabin about 20 miles from that campground. Whenever we take a drive up into the mountains and pass it by, that scream is always the first thing we talk about. I always wonder what was going on with that guy, and why was he just screaming and freaking out like that in the middle of nowhere? So this story takes place in southeast Texas, within 100 miles of Houston. I was in college at the time, but I moved back in with my parents for a semester, after some big roommate drama. My parents live out in the country miles outside of town with some acreage as well. The land in the back of the house consists of four zones, really. You got your backyard with the nice St. Augustine, the back back, which is a section of woods my parents cleared of underbrush and kept fairly maintained, the back back back, which was a clearing we used to go back and do bonfires and parties in high school, and then the woods. After high school, my parents kind of gave up on keeping back the brush and weeds from anything except their nice backyard section. Imagine a big backyard fenced in by a wall of huge weeds and tall trees that goes far, far back. 
then a field of even bigger weeds transitioning into solid, dense woods with oak, some pine, briar, and all that sort of stuff. I also had this dog my parents let me keep outside at the time. They had a big chain-link dog run she lived in since my parents had no perimeter fencing besides some barbed wire at the very, very back of the property. This dog was not the type to stay in one spot. In fact, she was very aggressive to other dogs, always going after them acting tough. I sometimes worried she'd get out and kill the neighbor's chickens one day. She was about 60 pounds and not a jumpy or scared dog at all. Since I was in college, I had no curfew or anything like that. I would always come home late at night or very early in the morning, after hanging out with friends all night or studying or what have you. On this particular night, it was pretty cold out. 50 degrees is cold and you can't tell me any different. Even though the dog had a house and bed and straw out there, I felt really bad for her staying out in such a cold environment, so instead I decided to bring her inside to sleep with me. I should have been more careful because this happened quite a bit, but somehow this dog always got me. She would wait in the back until the gate was unlocked and I was in the run, gate closed with an unlocked horseshoe latch. Then she'd sprint around me and pop the gate latch with her nose, then bolt off into the woods. Of course, in this exact moment, she did this same thing, and my dumbass was left standing there in the run in the cold in the middle of the night. I was extremely pissed because I knew I now had to go find her and bring her back. The moon was pretty bright out, and I had seen her fly into that big weed wall and disappear completely. I followed her in without any light calling out her name. There were some little trails through the weeds we tried to at least keep open so we could access the property, but these were less wide than a person can walk, and the weeds were about a head taller than me. It was quite dense. Anyway, I'd gone quite a ways in and had passed through the wooded section out into the clearing area, solid weeds all around five to eight feet tall. I got real quiet, listening and trying to hear the sounds of where she might be out there, when I could hear intermittent rustling out toward the woods. At this point, they were just really a tall, dark outline at the edge of this weed jungle. The rustling wasn't the sound I expected, though. Usually, she was crashing about through the woods. In my head, I was thinking, what the hell is she doing now? In all honesty, I thought she was probably rolling around in some dead skunk or something, and I was going to have to bathe her heavily. Figuring it was my wild-ass dog, I started to make my way toward the noise, calling out her name once again. As I got closer, though, it became quite apparent that this rustling was not the sound of an animal charging through underbrush, but more like something intentionally shaking the trees. Like how if you would grab a branch and shake it, and all the connected trees and vines would shake as well. I was close enough now to make out individual branches silhouetted at the top of the tree line, I could see that whatever was going on, it was causing the trees to shake all the way to the very top of the canopy. This was weird. This was decidedly not my dog just prancing around. I shut up immediately and froze. You hear a lot in these kinds of stories, people talking about how when they notice the woods just go silent. I can't remember if this happened or not, but as I stood there, I could clearly hear two or three loud, deep huffs. I guess it kind of sounded like a bull, but with an even deeper fluttering to it. Not like the tonal sounds a cow might make, but the deep, heavy exhale an animal makes when they're defensive. The sound seemed to come from around my head height. For some reason, my mind registered this thing was a lot closer to me than the tree line now. I also remember the distinct feeling that this noise was now directed at me. I immediately got this terrible feeling in my gut full body fear. I panicked. Rational or not, I called out my dog's name with all fear and urgency. You know, how your voice gets higher and louder at the end. I turned and sprinted away as hard as I could. Either my dog heard my tone and got scared, or she had also been scared of whatever was on that tree line too. Because as I crashed through those weeds, she came up on my left from a creek and flew past me like a bullet. When I got to the open garage, she was desperately trying to get in the back door to the house, jumping at it like a crazed animal. I closed it up and put her in the kennel and went to bed. I don't know what it was exactly, 
At the time, I convinced myself it was one of those hogzillas you hear about in the news. I'd been around plenty of cattle and never heard one make a noise quite like this. I know it probably really was just a big boar or something, but something just didn't quite feel right that night. This was like 10 years ago now, but I know for sure I'm still gonna think real hard about it if I ever have to go back out there alone at night again. I was told you guys might like this here. This happened when I was still growing up, around 2004 or 2005. I was about 13 years old back then, I think. It took place in a rural area, a good ways outside the town of Uvalde, Texas. The town itself was really small back then, not exactly much to look at, just one of those towns that really wasn't on the way to anywhere important. My father knew someone who owned a deer lease, it was about 1k acres, I think. It was just down outside of that area, and they were complaining a lot about a ton of hogs that were tearing up their land at the time. Being open season on hogs in the south, my dad thought he would surprise me that summer and take me down for a week to go hunting for them. Not only did that help him with networking for his job, but it also gave us a good opportunity for some quality father-son time. I remember the drive down there from Dallas was torture. It was about seven hours in total in my dad's hard top Jeep Wrangler. That car was so uncomfy. I hated it. All I really had to do on the drive was either stare out the window or try and beat Super Mario Land 2 on my Game Boy Pocket, something I was never able to accomplish throughout my youth. The drive obviously took almost the entire day, so we got there in the early evening. The owner of the land had told my dad that he hadn't had anyone lease it that year yet. The cabin in the property might be a little rough and dusty because of this. I didn't really care though. At this point in my life, I had been in the scouts for a couple of years now, and spent a lot of my free time in the woods or fishing with friends. Needless to say, I was more than comfortable roughing it. So after unlocking the gate and driving down to the cabin on the land, we settled in. The cabin was pretty rough. Dust and dirt everywhere, bunches of flies. I remember it looked like some raccoons had gotten into the cabin as well and crapped all over the place. After cleaning up a bit and getting the sleeping bags out, then setting up the cots, we decided to take a rest for the day. Something about that night was weird though. For some reason, I was never able to get a comfortable enough state to fall asleep for any restful amount. I couldn't quite put my finger on why but I remember having a distinct feeling of now being watched. I was finally able to drift off for what I guessed was maybe an hour at most. We woke up quite early, around 7am or so. We decided to scout around the land for tracks and signs of hogs, and find a good place to set up a blind. It was summertime and extremely hot in the afternoon, so morning was the best time to be out and about. After walking for an hour or so, we came to this area of trees which was lightly dense, and luckily found some signs of hogs there. Typically, torn up ground where they had been rooting, so we followed them out into the trees. I was looking for even more signs, when suddenly my dad stopped me with his arm. I remember looking up, and just seeing someone standing about 50 yards away, their body hiding behind trees. This was private land. This person was not supposed to be here. We also had confirmation from the owner before we came that nobody was here either, not to mention the gate had been completely locked up when we first arrived. The person was wearing some brightly colored red jacket. We slowly walked toward them. My dad called out to them, something like, Hey, we're hunters. This is private land you're on. The person didn't move at all though, dead still. We were about 30 yards away now. I could see that he was turned away from us, with his hands deep in his pockets. I started to notice something even weirder. This person was in what looked like a ski jacket, and what looked to be ski pants as well. Now, this was Texas in the summer, about 100 degrees outside by then. My dad called out again. No reaction. He signaled for me to stay behind him, and unsnapped the clip to his pistol holster. At the time, that's all we had since we were only scouting the area, 
The rifles had been left back at the cabin. We approached the person's right side slowly, and my dad told me to stay put about 20 yards away. I stayed and crouched down, and watched him circle around to the front of the man, all while talking to him and asking if something was wrong. He finally passed around to the front of the man. My dad stood bolt upright, with a confused look over his face. I called out to him and asked what was wrong. It's a mannequin. I walked over to it while my dad stood there staring. As I got closer, one thing stood out the most. The clothes this mannequin was wearing were brand new. No dust, no sap, no bird droppings, no signs of being outside for more than a day at most. I looked over at my dad. I could see him getting quite worried. Almost immediately, I felt that feeling again. We were being watched, and I could tell my dad felt it too. I wanted to start crying. I remember feeling suddenly so scared and vulnerable. My dad whispered to me, We're leaving, right now. He grabbed my hand and drew his pistol. He scanned the area the whole way back while I was trying my best to hold back panicked tears. We got back as fast as we could. I was so terrified it felt like an eternity, but in reality it was about 45 minutes. After returning, we packed up and beat feet right away. We drove back home that day and didn't talk very much on the way back. I remember right after we left, my dad called up his buddy, the owner of the land, and he was so confused. He told us he would go check it out next week when he was in the area. He also said he'd never had an issue with people there before because his property was high fenced. My dad normally isn't a paranoid person, but me being young and the least possibly having someone there we didn't know anything about, he decided to be cautious and just get out of there. Not worth being killed by a psycho in the woods or something. After we got home, we talked about it a bit. My dad wasn't able to sleep the night before either. He'd had the same feeling of someone watching us, but he didn't want to wake me up because he thought I was in a deep sleep. Turns out that next week, we got a call from his buddy. He checked the whole property. Never found a single trace of anyone. No mannequin either. That story still makes my hair stand on end. No idea what that was, but the paranoid man in me thinks it was some kind of trap or something. It's maybe not the creepiest thing that's happened to me in the woods, but it's definitely top three. Whoever was out there, I have no idea what you wanted, but I'm glad we didn't get the chance to meet. Hi y'all, this happened to me about 11 years ago, when walking home from a friend's house late at night. I'll just get straight into the story. I used to live in a rural part of the UK, and I've lived in rural areas most of my life. I was used to having long walks, occasionally at night, especially before I could drive. They never really bothered me too much. I'd get creeped out occasionally because of the atmosphere or whatever, but this one night was the most terrifying experience I ever had. There was this one friend who used to live roughly three miles away from my house or so. He had really cool parents and my other friends and I would often go over to his house and play video games with him and hang out. Occasionally, this meant walking home at night if I happened to stay late. There were two ways back from his house. The roadway, which was about five miles long, and took about 30 to 45 minutes. The roads were quiet and eerie sometimes, but they were lit up by street lamps, so it never really bothered me walking this way. The other way, though, was a shortcut through these woods. It took off about two miles from the trip. The wooded bit was about a mile or so long. I often favored this wooded shortcut, and I'd probably walked it over 100 times at this point. The woods were dark, however, Combined with the lack of ambient light due to living in a rural area, you had almost absolute abyssal darkness. Luckily, at least most of the time, I had my phone light to walk with. Sometimes, though, my phone would just die, or the battery would be so low the flash wouldn't work, and I'd have to use my screen light instead. As you probably guessed by now, this was one such occasion. I remember my friends and I had just finished up watching a film. It was about 10 p.m., so we all started to leave my friend's house and head our separate ways home. 
I contemplated briefly on which way I should go when I decided to take the shortcut through the woods. I started walking away from his house and towards the path that headed off into that forest. The streetlights dimmed as I entered the field before it. I glanced at my phone and saw my battery was really low. Only enough power left for a couple of minutes of flash. Then I'd have to use my screen for light. That wouldn't last the entire way either. As I saw the tree line approaching, I switched on the flash and followed the well-trodden path out into the dark. To my dismay though, my light died within seconds of entering. I flipped my phone over to try and at least shine the way using the screen. As I walked, I looked out for all of the familiar landmarks I was used to seeing to ensure I was heading in the right direction. A funky tree stump here, check. Half-fallen fir tree, check. Enormous puddle I had to jump over, check. All was going well so far. About halfway through though, my phone completely died altogether. I remember the exact moment this happened. It was like I had suddenly been engulfed in darkness. I'm not sure if you've ever experienced this level yourself, but it was so dark I couldn't even see my own hand, only an inch in front of my face. Naturally, my pace slowed down considerably, and I started having to hold my hands out in front of me to make sure I wasn't going to walk into a tree or something. I continued to walk for another minute or so, until all of a sudden, a pungent smell wafted over me. Cigarette smoke. I glanced around, but of course I couldn't see anything. Then I heard it, though. A single cough. I wasn't alone. Thoughts raced through my head. Who would be out in the woods this dark? Were they following me? Had I gotten lost or something? I started to quicken my pace, throwing a little bit of caution to the wind. I carried on walking and tripped slightly on a branch. As I regained my balance, I could hear another sound. Branches breaking underfoot, what sounded like immediately behind me. The snapping turned into fast footsteps and grew louder and louder. I began to sprint into that darkness. I felt the well-trodden path turn into brush. I felt branches and logs and plants now hitting my legs. Needless to say, it was not long before I fell down hard. I was lying on the floor in the dark, holding my knee in pain. I could hear branches snapping around me, and a voice muttering something incomprehensibly. I didn't dare to move. All of a sudden, a torch turned on in the darkness. I couldn't see anything except this single beam of light, which seemed to be eaten quickly by the rest of the darkness in the forest. I laid there motionless on the ground as the beam started to sweep throughout the trees. I could still hear this person mumbling and now growling. The crunching of footfalls grew closer and closer. They were only a few feet from me by this point. I couldn't even breathe. The light went out. The snapping of branches grew and then nothing. Complete silence. My eyes were wide open, but I couldn't see a single thing. Then though, I heard wheezing right above me. The man was standing over me. I wanted to cry. I wasn't sure if the person could see me or not. They could have been staring right at me, and I wouldn't even have known. This carried on for five minutes, until the crunching of leaves and snapping of twigs started again. It got fainter and fainter, as they now moved away from me. I remained lying down for another solid five to ten minutes, contemplating the best way to escape. Like an idiot, I'd ran off the path and I wasn't sure where I was now, or what the way back home was even. I didn't really care though. I was going to walk in one single direction until I left the woods and get home from there. I knew as soon as I started moving again, if this person was still there they would hear me instantly. Should I try to run or try and sneak out? I opted for the latter. I slowly rose to my feet, listening constantly to my surroundings. I picked a direction and started walking. It wasn't perfectly quiet, but it was quiet enough to be sure I wouldn't be heard from too far away. I kept hearing snapping sounds and rustling in the distance around me. Every single time I would freeze, I'd hold my breath until I was happy no one was there and then start walking again. I repeated this pattern for what felt like an eternity until eventually I found the correct path. I screamed for joy in my mind and sped up my pace. 
After another ten minutes, I saw it. The light. Street lights flittering in through the trees. I'd never been so happy before to see a meager street lamp, but as I progressed to the end of the woods, my heart started to sink. I could see at the very end of the path was a black silhouette. Unmoving, contrasted against the light background, was the dark figure of a man standing there and waiting. What should I do now? Maybe it's a different person, perhaps someone walking their dog or something. I froze and watched them silently from the darkness, but they didn't move a single inch. They stood there, like they were guarding the entrance to the woods, or perhaps waiting for me. I didn't know what to do. By this point, though, I'd had enough. I was so close to getting out of there. I decided to bolt straight towards the exit, right towards them. I was a six-foot young man. If they wanted to stop me at a full sprint, they'd have a hard job of it, I thought. That's what I did. I started sprinting. The figure grew and grew as I approached them, and I stepped out to the side. I heard someone growl loudly and felt something clip the back of my head and tug on the back of my jacket. I cleared the sheep gate, though, in one leap and sprinted into the light, breaking free from their grasp. I eventually stopped running when I could see the first house and looked back. The entrance to the woods was quite far away now and I couldn't see anyone standing there anymore. Relaxing a bit more now, I finished my walk home. And that's pretty much it. I know it could have been me overreacting. Maybe it was someone out for a walk in the woods, a dog walker or a camper. I thought it was strange, though, that they didn't use their torch ever in that darkness, except briefly on that one occasion. Once they heard me as well, they seemed to actively seek me out. Who knows what would have happened if they would have caught me. In any case, I never walked that way home alone again, and definitely never at night. So this literally happened 30 minutes ago. I'm driving to work, and it's about 3.30 a.m. or so. I take three different routes to work, but I've been taking the same one for a while now, since there's construction on every other route. I'm driving down this road, and on either side of it, there were many subdivisions. I was listening to a podcast, trying my best to keep myself awake until I could grab some coffee. I started to get this uneasy feeling in my stomach. I thought it was my body telling me to get some caffeine and maybe something to eat. I tried my best to ignore it and continue driving. All of a sudden, though, this guy just runs out into the middle of the road. I could barely even see him, since he was wearing on all dark clothes. Thankfully, I managed to slow down in time, and I noticed he looked pretty freaked out. Now, I listen to a lot of creepy podcasts ranging from true crime to supernatural. I know the rules to stay safe in unexpected situations. I wish I listened to them today. Normally, I wouldn't stop for something like this, but I knew that if something happened to me, I would want someone to stop and help. So, that's what I tried to do. I kept my car running just in case, and rolled down the window just a little bit, so I could talk to this guy and figure out what was wrong. I called out to ask if he was okay. He immediately started freaking out. He told me someone was trying to kill him. They had killed his dog and ripped it apart on his front lawn, he tried to grab the remains and run away and bury it, but he saw the man running after him with a knife. He said he thought it was probably a coyote or something at first, so he hadn't been suspicious, but he had run off when he saw the man coming at him. Now I was pretty freaked out too, but in my mind, I noticed something. Yeah, it was dark out, but with the lights on inside my car and the lights that were on out front of the subdivisions, I could still see fairly well. He was younger, about his mid-thirties, dark black hair and green eyes. He was wearing a hunter's jacket and jeans. What I noticed, however, that didn't match his story was that there was no blood or fur anywhere on him. I asked if his dog had been torn up so badly, why wasn't there any blood on him? Immediately, his demeanor changed. It was like turning off a switch or something. My blood went cold. He just stared at me. What came out of his mouth next was the final straw for me. He started shaking severely and convulsing. 
then his whole body relaxed at the same time. He stopped shaking, and he leaned in close towards my window and smiled at me. It was that twisted type of smile, and his eyes were dark. I was going to help you, you know. He started cackling and trying to rip open my car door. Immediately, I rolled up the window, put my car into drive, and sped off down the road, not stopping for anything. Once I finally got to work, I started crying. I still had ten minutes before I had to go in, and honestly, I was terrified to even get out of my car. This is the story of my brief friendship with a guy that damn near stalked me, and I'm sharing it for some closure, I think. I started my freshman year of college at a university in my hometown that's pretty nice. I'm not going to share too much about it, but it has a smaller amount of students. Enough that you don't really run into people too often, actually. I lived on campus and was only 17 at the time. I had a Tinder, of course, as I was fresh out of a relationship and looking to experience new things in college. I matched with this one boy, Asher, who seemed nice enough at first. Pretty socially awkward, but I never really minded that sort of thing. I have some anxiety issues myself, so I'm pretty sympathetic to it. Because of that, I ignored a lot of warning signs I probably shouldn't have. We texted for a while, and he seemed really nice and caring. He wanted to know a lot about me, which I wasn't too keen on sharing. I told him the basics, and we texted pretty regularly, though. He lived on campus as well, and invited me to hang out. At the time, things didn't seem sketchy at all, so of course I was completely down. When I first met him, though, that's when things started to get a bit uncomfortable. We hung out in his dorm at first, which was pretty standard overall. I got cozy with him on his couch. I'd say cuddling, but not quite there. When we started talking more, though, I realized that something was a bit off. He kept making comments that would just put me off right away. I tried to ignore them, though. Things like, I've never cuddled with anyone before. Sorry if I'm doing this wrong. So many comments about how he wanted me to stay forever. Weird word choice, but whatever. He was just trying to do his own thing. I'd let him down easy. I ended that hangout pretty quickly for some fake excuse and went right back to my room. He kept on texting me and professing how much he was into me. I told him sorry, but I'm not really looking for any kind of relationship. I didn't want things to be romantic. It was a bad lie, but I'm very non-confrontational and I didn't want to be mean. It's not like he had really done anything wrong, we just didn't really click. And that's when things started to get really weird, though. He immediately sent me this huge paragraph, saying how it was okay if I didn't want a relationship right now. Instead, he'd wait for me as long as it took, and save his virginity for me. We had never even talked about anything sexual. I had never even really told him I liked him or flirted back. I just never turned him down. Unfortunately, that was just the start of everything. He would not leave me alone after, even though I kept trying to de-escalate things. I would keep running into him all over campus, and other places as well. I wasn't sure how he would always just suddenly manage to be nearby right when my classes ended. I also wasn't sure why we'd suddenly both be in the dining hall at the exact same time, even though I hadn't changed my regular routine at all. I tried to brush it off, though. That was definitely a mistake. I ended up turning him down completely eventually, because now I was getting creeped out. I couldn't figure out how he wasn't getting what I was putting out, that I didn't want anything romantic with him. He started to really guilt trip me, telling me about how he was going to kill himself and nobody else would ever love him. I'd been in a manipulative relationship in the past, so I recognized that behavior right away and shut it down. I told him I couldn't even be friends with him if he was going to say stuff like that. In my head, that was that. He actually didn't reply for a while, but when he did once more, all hell broke loose. I was luckily out of town at the time for a concert, so that made me feel a lot better. He immediately went off, though. 
paragraph after paragraph about how horrible a person I was. I was such a slut. He needed to put me in my place. All the regular nice guy things you could think of. I could handle that much though. I just ignored all his nasty words. It seemed though, once the regret set in from him saying all those things, he made it his mission in life to win me over however possible. He apologized profusely, told me he could not stand being all alone, and I was his only friend in the world. Whatever, terrible, but at the moment I didn't really care about that. To prove his dedication to me though, he did the creepiest thing yet. First, he texted me he was outside my room right now. We did not live in the same dorm building, and you can't get into the buildings unless you live there. I don't know how we got in. At the moment, I was not there, and my roommate was also not home, so at least that much was okay. I texted back at that point and told him to leave. Just how creepy that shit was. He pulled out his last resort. He sent me screenshots of my contact in his phone. On Apple devices, you can fill in tons of information and even have a notes section as well. I could see everything was full. He somehow knew my home address, my room number on campus, my parents' and brothers' names, my pets' nicknames, my whole schedule. It was terrifying because I'm a very private person. The only social media I have is my Instagram, and I've never shared a single thing on it about that kind of stuff. I don't think I'll ever find out how he discovered all of this about me. I blocked him on everything right away, and reported him to the school as well. Of course, the school did nothing at all. I still see him around on campus, and other places as well, and he still tries to approach me whenever he manages to see me. I always duck and run away as fast as possible, and that's worked for me so far. It's terrifying, though, to think what he might do one day. I was a new manager of a very old building at the time. I came from social work and was hired to manage a building that was about to celebrate its 100th anniversary. My office was down in the basement, along with several below-ground apartments as well. Of these apartments, there was an elderly fellow I knew who was on palliative care for extreme kidney failure. He would get medication and food delivered every other week or so, so when it wasn't brought in once, I rang him in. When I got no answer, I asked the police for a welfare check on the man. This was a very warm June. The way the building was constructed, you couldn't smell something wafting out of an apartment unless the door was opened and allowed the smell out. Once the police opened the door, everyone knew he must have been dead for a long time. The smell absolutely permeated everything. The smell of rotten human got sucked into the air ducts, and it was not something you would ever forget. Fast forward one month now to July. Now mind you, there are 105 tenants in this four-story building. I get a call from one tenant's niece that she hasn't heard from her uncle in a while. Could we please check on him and make sure he was okay? Of course, I knew this guy. I'd just pop up and make sure he was okay real quick and we'd have a good laugh together. No answer. I called the police for a welfare check once again. It had been a steady 85 degrees outside for a few weeks, and yes, he had sadly passed away. The smell. The smell of a dead human is so much different than the smell of other dead things. It's like a sticky sweet smell combined with an acrid taste and a heavy, I don't really know how to describe it, perhaps a dead meat, mushroom sort of smell? It doesn't smell like other rotten stuff. The ME made a joke about me staging this just to see him again. The smell was so bad in the hallway just from opening the door for that few minutes to take the body out. I had entire families fleeing from the building in tears. I knew I had to do something to mitigate this crap. I knew he had passed on a small carpet in the middle of the room, so I put some methanol under my nostrils, double gloved up, wrapped up my pants legs, 
and pulled the carpet that was pretty thick with adipose tissue. I had told the coroner what was going on before I did this. I slipped in his goo. I double-bagged his carpet and opened the windows. It's rough to think about it. It involved large fans and my staying up all night. Cut to one month later now. I'm putting in notices on doors for an upcoming bed bug inspection. Immediately, I smelled that smell as I passed by the fourth floor. That acrid dead smell. Someone was deceased. There's no mistaking it at this point. I started knocking on doors. Only one of about 25 answered because it was in the middle of the day. It's not like I can just bust into their apartment and go check. I called the police and they came out and confirmed it was definitely a dead body, but nobody could figure out where it was coming from. I stood there trying to figure out if a dead body constituted an emergency so I could circumvent that 48-hour rule of entering an apartment. The police also told me that without something else, they couldn't start busting down doors either. We walked up and down the halls and just could not figure out where this dead smell of a body was coming from. I went to my office to print up 48-hour notices of intent to enter. I laid down in my bed that night and started thinking about it. The smell of a dead body had only entered the hallway when the door was opened. Someone had the smell in there and had opened a door. Someone had opened a door. Day of, I go apartment to apartment. Ten apartments in and this white-haired middle-aged dude answers the door. Immediately, I can smell huge wafts of bleach coming from his apartment. Instead of hanging out like most people would do, when someone is inspecting your apartment, he immediately took off running. The floor had been fully bleached. The kitchen had been fully bleached. The entire apartment was spotless. The neighbors later said that he told people that some chicken had gone bad. But I know that chicken does not smell like that. I contacted the non-emergency line that day. But without anything else to go on, there wasn't a lot they could do, unfortunately. In the end, that guy got away. This happened to me just last night, and I'm left still feeling pretty uncomfortable about the entire exchange. Before I jump into this, I'll give you a little bit of background and context. I work with a guy named Mike who is about two years older than me. Shortly after meeting Mike, he friended me on Facebook. I accepted because I wanted to avoid any awkwardness at work, and I didn't really use it that often anyway. Mike would often send me weird messages that were completely out of the blue and all unrelated to each other. Nothing particularly creepy though or even worthwhile discussing. I figured he just wanted an excuse to talk or perhaps make a friend, so I did my best to give him the hint that I wasn't interested, without being too rude. I would respond with one-word answers days later, or even not at all. I'd also bring up the fact I had a boyfriend fairly frequently, whenever he spoke with me both online and in person. Honestly though, it hadn't really been a huge deal up until this point, just more of a mild annoyance that I mostly didn't think about. I started to realize from my experiences with him at work that he may just have an issue with social interactions. That led me to believe that he was even more mild than I'd previously thought he was. He had a hard time picking up on sarcasm or body language and usually started conversations by bringing up the exact same topics over and over. Most of our conversations in person involved him asking a series of questions I'd answer out of politeness followed by an awkward silence I usually felt forced to end by asking, And you? Anyway, last night I was working. He came to visit unprompted once again from a different floor, later in the evening when most of the residents were already in bed. We're both PCAs, by the way. Everything started up the same way. Have you seen any good movies lately? Do you like to drive fast? I've seen you speeding in your brand name of my car. After work, do you drink? You like to go to the beach? I was only half paying attention because I was doing paperwork. I tried to make it pretty clear I was busy. I wasn't too interested in an interrogation at the moment. Then though, he leaned in and asked me, Have you ever killed a hog? 
I thought I heard him ask wrong, so again I asked, What? I turned to look at him. I said, Have you ever killed a hog? I laughed a little awkwardly. What an unexpected and weird question. Uh, no? He just stood there smiling, and because it was so awkward, I eventually had to ask, Have you? He laughed hysterically and said, Yeah. This left me weirded out. Well, why did you do that? He looked at me extremely confused. What do you mean, why? Well, why did you kill that hog, dude? He continued to laugh. So what, you just went out and killed a pig for no reason? No, no, it was for a function. I let out an uncomfortable laugh of relief, but before things could go back to normal, he hit me with a sucker punch. Yeah, I was the one that got to kill it. I got to see it beg for its life while I slit its throat. At this point, I was completely shocked. I was creeped out and a little worried no one else was around right now. I knew enough about him to know this was not a joke. Dude, why would you say it like that? He laughed even more. I watched it beg for its life, and then I slit its throat open. Dude, stop, seriously. He smiled at me and I started to ignore him now. I texted my boyfriend because that was pretty thoroughly disturbing. It was quiet for a few moments. Yeah, it took a long time to bleed out too. Much longer than the other animals I killed. A lot more blood, I think. Mike, stop. I thought you liked horror movies. Come on. Yeah, I do, but this is creepy and you're making me uncomfortable. Mike started to linger, repeating these same creepy statements every once in a while. Now, I was fully ignoring him, though. Finally, he stopped, and then again out of the blue, Do you have an Instagram, maybe? Even though I was pissed, I was more than a little relieved at this change of topic. I responded with a very rude and angry, Yeah, I do. At that point, he simply shrugged and walked away. I wish that was the end of it, because as if I was not freaked out enough, ten minutes later, the phone at the desk rings. I, thinking it's a resident's family member as usual, answer. But no, it's Mike calling from his floor. Hey, do you want to go out to eat octopus later, maybe? I was completely done with this dude because I was angry. No, leave me alone. I hear him do a little snicker. Okay, how about pork, then? I tell him a resident needs me and hang up, busy relaying the story to others over text when finally my co-worker on my floor for the night makes an appearance. We were sitting there together, but I refrained from telling him what just happened because he was a lot older. Maybe he might think it's funny or misunderstand and be friends with Mike. The phone rings again ten minutes later. I ask my co-worker to answer the phone this time. It's Mike again, and I can tell by the side of the conversation I can hear he was looking to speak with me. He asked about the resident I said I needed to help. My co-worker didn't know about the problem, and jokingly told him to come down and hang out with us. Before I could make any sort of gesture to say no, my co-worker turned to me and said, Mike wants to know your favorite type of food so he can bring you some. This guy was relentless. I told my co-worker I didn't want him to come. He relayed the message before hanging up a few seconds later. The phone rang again before we left, but this time thankfully it wasn't him. I was a little bit worried about walking to my car at this point. I was super weirded out, and he already made it clear he knew exactly which one was mine. I called my friend to talk to me as I walked through the dark parking lot, but thankfully Mike did not make an appearance there, and I got home okay in the end. Maybe it was an overreaction on my part, but the whole thing creeped me out. I'm honestly pretty worried about the next time I'll have to work a shift with him. I grew up in a very safe, very affluent neighborhood. It was unheard of for anyone to lock their cars or houses, and whenever someone new moved into the neighborhood, it was only mere moments before they were welcomed with open arms and open doors. Despite being surrounded by what could be described as one large neighborhood family, my mom was very particular about house rules being followed one of which was never going out alone. Walking over to a friend's house, three of us need to go together, 
so two could walk home together after dropping everyone off. It was rare, but occasionally just two of us would be able to sneak out from under her watchful eye and run to the corner store a few blocks down for some candy or soda. One sweltering day during the summer I turned nine, I found myself home alone and extremely restless. I decided to take my sister's cool new 10-speed for a spin around the block a few times. Now, even though I was tall for my age, this bike was still a few inches too big for me. I decided that didn't matter though. I jumped on and started pedaling away. My first lap around the neighborhood went off without a hitch. The birds were chirping, the sun was shining, the wind was blowing through my curled hair and felt wonderful. The second lap around the block though, I passed an older, unfamiliar car parked by the side of the road. The sun reflected off the huge scrape down the side, temporarily shocking my vision into bright blue stripes. I furiously tried to blink them away while I almost fell. On the third lap around, I saw this car pull off the side of the road, now heading towards me. A tiny pit of unease began to grow in my stomach as the driver slowed when he passed me by. I chalked it up to just being scared of getting caught out alone and continued on my way. I picked up speed as I rounded the corner toward my house and decided to go for one more time around the block. I'd have to make it quick though to beat my mom home and avoid the trouble I knew I'd be in if she caught me out there. I hit the bottom of the hill next to our house with some speed and started to climb to the top, slowing more and more the closer I got. By the time I actually reached the summit I had to stop and catch my breath, teetering the too tall bike at my hip. As I stood there struggling to catch my breath, the hairs on the back of my neck immediately stood up, my arms locked on the handlebars, and every inch of my body froze. I had been caught. I just knew it. I could hear a car creeping up behind me. It just had to be my mom. Only, it wasn't. When relief should have washed over me, that unknown dread only deepened, further stiffening my frozen limbs. I turned around to see that same old car with the same blinding scratch down the side, slowing down right next to me. The man stopped that car next to my bike on the wrong side of the street, and through his opening driver door, started to ask me if I had seen a stray dog running about. He had come off of his leash and run off on his own. I froze. This was the cliché question they had warned us about in school so many times the one every kidnapper supposedly uses. I decided if I answered him firmly and rode my bike away, he would know this simple plan would not work on me. Plus, he might just really be looking for his dog. This was my plan, at least. My terrified little body betrayed that plan, and a trembling, no, is all I could manage. I fumbled my feet to the pedals of this bike that was too large for me and his door flew open. He lunged out toward me. No, leave me alone, I said as I wobbled my way past his open car door, his hand brushing the back of my shirt and knocking my back tire. I pedaled as fast as I could the 50 feet into the next driveway I saw. I pedaled legs burning up the drive, running my front tire so hard into my neighbor's front step that it bent the wheel entirely. My body catapulted over the handlebars, and I burst through my neighbor's front door. Eddie! Eddie, help me! My neighbor was not home, though. I ran into the kitchen, still calling in hopes I was wrong. Suddenly, I heard a voice behind me. And what do you think you're doing? I froze. I heard my heartbeat in my ears, feeling the blood pumping through my veins. I knew this was it for me. I slowly turned around, not knowing what else to do. Only, there stood my neighbor's son, home from college early. I dissolved into tears, gulping out what happened. He tossed the bent bike into the back of his truck and drove me around the corner to the safety of home. My mom was home and had the look of death in her eyes until she saw the tears streaming down my face. The police were immediately called. The neighbors were called as well. The car had been spotted frantically circling the block the few minutes following our encounter, but he was long gone by the time the police arrived. To this day, 20 years later, I still have a hard time riding my bike alone. 
I still get chills when cars slow down next to me. I still wonder if the next girl that guy attacked was as lucky as I was. This happened to me when I was about 18 years old. I was big into running back then and lived in a town that was a suburb but had big swaths of farmland, as in smallish tomato and strawberry fields, not huge never-ending fields of wheat or anything like that. I preferred running on the dirt at the edges of these fields. It was a lot easier on my legs than running long distances on concrete or asphalt at least. I was usually training for half marathons at the time. 13.1 miles for those who aren't insane enough to believe running is fun. This particular day, I was planning to run an easy six miles. I told my mom and she suggested I do a loop, then meet them at the dog park, about three miles away from our house, as my halfway point. This was pre-cell phone area, when all the craziest shit seemed to go down. Being careful, I took a walkie-talkie my dad always used, and my mom took the other one. Now, the walkie-talkie had a range longer than the ones my brother and I played around with when we were younger. Even still, it would definitely not work three miles away. Honestly, I had no idea what the exact range was. So, I take off on my run. I'm planning to go on the sidewalk for a bit until I get to those fields. I think they were lettuce fields back then. I'm not sure, but they were short, small plants. I was running in the dirt with the road a few yards to my left. I have to run south, then turn right onto a slightly smaller, less traveled road to get to that dog park. As I'm running on the first dirt part, my parents drive by and being dorks, they honk, wave, and yell at me. I waved and soon after made my turn onto the smaller road. This is one road. Me on flat dirt, small drainage ditch by my side, forever field of lettuce all around me, then a wall that was the backyard of some houses. I started noticing how quiet this street was, and just how few cars were passing by now. At that moment, I randomly started thinking to myself, if someone tried to do something, I could run over to those houses. No, they're so far away, I'd never make it in time. Then I hear a car but this one doesn't pass me by like all the others. I hear it slow down behind me, just out of my peripheral vision. My senses go super alert, and I immediately realize what a dumbass I was to pick this route. Now I'm stuck out here in the middle of nowhere, with no one to help me and nowhere to hide. The car starts speeding enough so that it's right next to me. I glance over to see a man, middle-aged, white-haired, totally normal-looking, but immediately I get a chill down my spine. He leans over into the passenger seat and says in a super sweet voice, Hi there, where you going? You need a ride? I was scared. I realized this was not good. Admittedly, nothing had happened yet. He could totally innocently be just wanting to chat, but my intuition was in overdrive, telling me this man was a danger. I hopped over the ditch, thinking that would at least make it harder for his car to follow me if I needed to take off across the field to try and make it to those houses in the distance. That pissed him off apparently. He gunned it, got closer to the ditch, and in front of where I was, said in a voice I can only describe as a bone-chilling evil, You know, you shouldn't be out here all alone. Something horrible could happen to you, you know, and no one would ever know where to find you. He put his car in park and took off his seatbelt. I remembered that walkie-talkie in that moment. The piece of crap was all static because it was too far away. I immediately turned down the volume so he couldn't hear. Hey, Dad, yeah, yeah, I see your car over there. I'm over here by this red Buick. Do you see me? I fake waved over to no one. There was no car coming from the direction my parents were. When I started talking, there was no one behind us either. But by the grace of the universe, in that exact moment a car turned down onto that road. The man saw it, looked at me, and sped off so fast he left skid marks on the pavement. I'd never run faster in my life. I was looking behind me every few seconds and thought he'd be waiting for me at every intersection I had to cross. 
I was shaking and scared and relieved when I got to that goddamn dog park. I told my parents everything, and my mom called the cops right away. They took a statement, but said it would help if something actually happened to someone else. The weird part was, I was having trouble getting my story out because I was so upset. Before I even gave a description of the car, the cop asked me, was it a red Buick by chance? He wouldn't tell us why he said that, but that just added to my feeling I had narrowly escaped something awful. This happened yesterday, and I still can't believe it happened at all. I'll explain it all at the end, so I'm sorry if it's confusing at first. I've recently moved into a new apartment. About three weeks ago, I'm sharing it with my sister. The only person we know properly is a single mom who lives in the apartment next to us. Ever since we moved in, she's always been giving us advice and helping us out with lots of things as well. We don't know any of our other neighbors properly yet though. Today, I was out with some friends, and after that I went to get my sister so we could go out together for some food. We got home at around 10pm. My sister and I got into our PJs and were sitting around watching TV when our buzzer rang. I jumped up to answer it. It turned out to be our neighbor, that nice single mom. I asked her what was up. She told me our dad was looking for us downstairs. Straight away, my stomach dropped. I immediately asked her if she's sure he said he was our dad. The reason I asked was just to make sure that's what she actually said. But then she replied, Yeah, he said he was your dad and was looking for you. The neighbor asked me if she should let him up to our flat, but I told her no. I wanted to shout out to my sister, but I didn't want to worry her right away. I asked my neighbor to not let him come up yet and I heard her go out and repeat this to him. I couldn't hear anything for a few minutes, and I started to get really worried. At this point, my sister came up to us and asked me who it was. I called out to my neighbor a few times, but she didn't answer. It must have only been about a minute, but it honestly felt like ages when she didn't reply. I was about to tell my sister to call 000. I was starting to panic, and I didn't know what was going on out there. The neighbor came back in and told me the man was gone. She then came up to our flat and explained what had gone down. She said that she was walking back after finishing her work and she saw a man by the buzzers. At first, she assumed he was just someone who lived there, but when he noticed her walking up, he asked for us by name and asked if she could let him up to our flat. When she'd asked him who he was, he told her he was our dad. Obviously, she buzzed us and told us first since our neighbor didn't know us well enough to know what our dad looked like. She said because we were young and on our own, she didn't want to just buzz a strange man up right away. Well, her mom instincts had kicked in when she heard me being hesitant to let him in. She said that apparently after he heard me say that, he got really pushy with her and started trying to shove her out of the way. He kept on saying over and over again, It's okay, I'm their dad, let me in, I'm not going to do anything. She began to argue with him and told him that if I didn't feel comfortable letting him in, there was no way he was getting in. He then called her a bitch, got in the car, and drove away. Now, this is the reason why I hesitated. We haven't spoken to our dad since I was 16. We had even considered getting a restraining order from him at one point. He's not our biological father, but we were legally adopted by him when I was nine. He was extremely abusive. It was so bad, me, my sister, and my mom had to sneak out and leave him in the middle of the night. He was always really controlling, and after we left, he would secretly follow us around, leaving threatening males on the phone. I found out he had a criminal record as well. I believe he was convicted of manslaughter in the 80s. I have no idea of the backstory behind that, and honestly, I don't really want to know. Like I said, we haven't heard from him since I was 16, which was three years ago. So as soon as she said the word dad, I almost had a panic attack. I asked her to describe the man. She said that because it was so dark out, she couldn't really see him very well. We ended up staying with her then, because me and my sister were really shaken up. I don't know whether to call the cops or not. I don't know if it's him or not either, as it could easily have been someone else pretending to be him.
I'm writing this as my girlfriend tells me the story, so these will all be her words pretty much. My job is really just to type this all up and try not to screw it up too much. When I was 12 years old or so, I spent the night with my best friend, Carrie. We had big plans for our sleepover, you see. We were planning to stay up all night, listen to music, play board games, and talk about boys. You know, the usual stuff little girls like to do. Around 2 a.m. after her parents were sleeping, we decided we were really hungry. We knew we had to be quiet so we didn't wake them up, so we tiptoed into the hallway from her room. As we made our way into the kitchen, we had to go through the dining room as well. Because we were being so quiet to avoid being caught, we could hear a slight tapping noise. Instantly, we both knew it was someone tapping on the living room window. You could see into the living room from the dining room, so immediately our heads turned towards that room. We could see a figure standing on the porch right next to the window. And because of the way the porch light was illuminating the figure, it looked like a shadow or a silhouette. We thought it must be Carrie's sister's boyfriend at first. The sister and boyfriend had been banned from seeing each other recently. We assumed this was his weird way of getting our attention. We decided that either he would just leave on his own, Tina, Carrie's sister, would go see him, or Carrie's parents would wake up and run him out of town. We didn't want that last possibility to happen because we had already been told to go to sleep more than once already. We knew we'd get in trouble for sneaking into the kitchen for food when we were supposed to be sleeping. As we walked through the dining room, we could hear the figure keep tapping on the window. When he came into full view though, we knew for sure it was a man, only now we could tell he was holding a knife in his hand. The knife was what he was tapping with in the first place. Because this window had no shades, blinds, or curtains, we were certain he could now see us as well. We both dropped down to the floor and started crawling to the kitchen. When we made it there, we literally sat in the middle of the kitchen floor, whispering about what we had just seen. We were both absolutely sure we saw the same man with a knife. We knew we had to get to our parents' room as quickly as possible. To do this, though, we had to walk through the living room. We sat there in the kitchen trying to figure out just how we were going to get out of there without him seeing us. We peeked around the kitchen wall and could see him still standing there on the front porch. It wasn't possible. We couldn't possibly make it to the parents' room without him seeing us once more. We knew we had to find a door that had a lock in case he came in through the sliding glass door, since that currently had no lock as it was broken. The sliding glass door was in the dining room, right next to where we were we decided to crawl back to her room. Just as we did this, we heard the front doorknob jiggling. We freaked out. We crawled back to her room as fast as possible and locked the door. We crawled to her bedroom window that faced the street so we could see if he was still standing there on the front porch. We couldn't see him anymore. We didn't hear him tapping either. As we continued to watch from her window, we saw him exit her yard and start walking up the street towards the main highway. I could see the knife shimmering off the streetlights as he walked. It appeared to be a huge butcher's knife. When we realized he was leaving, we ran into our parents' room to tell them what had happened. We told them what we had seen, but due to our overactive imaginations and hundreds of stories that freaked us out prior, they didn't believe us. We reluctantly went back to our bedroom and locked the door. We ended up sleeping on the floor hidden by the bed from any windows in our room. The next morning was Sunday. Carrie's dad always walked down to the corner store up the street to get a paper, coffee, and some smokes. That day, he came back empty-handed, though. He said the store was roped off with police tape, and it turned out the clerk had been stabbed to death earlier last night. This creepy experience must have happened about a year ago now, around Halloween or so. To this day, it still creeps me the fuck out. Me and my twin sister Lauren are both now 20 and had just moved into our first flat three months before this happened. Our parents helped us move in and my dad hired a van to get all of our stuff with us. The whole family, including my older brother Sam, who was visiting from England, 
helped us move over our furniture and numerous boxes into the flat. As our family helped us to settle in, luckily enough, we found out our flat was actually also next door to one of our dad's old best friends, Danny. This was pretty great. We hadn't seen him and his wife for about 10 years now, and it was nice to catch up. The neighborhood we lived in, which was a smallish village about an hour or so from Glasgow, Scotland, is 99% of the time really quiet. Everyone around the area is genuinely nice, but this one night, something wasn't quite right. Like I've said already, we had only really gotten used to the area we were living in directly, but after what happened on this night, I always have my wits about me from then on. It was a dark winter's night in late October or early November. I believe it might have been a Thursday. My sister and I decided to stay up until about half one in the morning, as we sometimes did after a long week at college. We'd stay up together drinking, stuffing our faces, and talking about random things like acting, the subjects we were both studying, motorbikes, guys, just some general bitching too. Mostly the normal, random stuff any normal young woman would like to talk about. We then decided to put the lights out and go to bed as we had grown quite tired after all this talking. I'd do the normal nightly routine, like check everything was turned off and that the door was locked, which it was, thankfully, as a few nights previously I'd forgotten to lock it during the night. With everything on the list safely checked off, we both went to bed and fell asleep as usual. Just to set the layout of the flat a bit, me and my sister were on the first floor above this old woman, Betty. She was rather lovely, but she couldn't go out too often, so we didn't see her very much. Our bedroom was right next to the porch and the front door, and our bedroom window looked out onto the street. It was about 4 a.m. when we awoke to a loud, sudden knocking at our door. I was expecting a parcel the next day, so initially I thought it might be the postman coming a bit early. When I checked the time on my phone, though, which I usually left on in case of emergencies, it was somewhere around 4.20 to 4.30, I think. Still being tired and disoriented, I realized it was still far too dark out to be about 10 a.m. when the postman usually came, even though the mornings were much darker now during the winter months. The banging on the door lasted for what felt like 20 minutes. It might have been a bit less, but it was a really long time. My sister and I were too scared to move from our beds, only whispering quietly to each other to just ignore that banging on the door. After all, who would be comfortable answering the door to a stranger knocking at this ungodly hour? I usually didn't answer the door to strangers anyway, or even answer mobile numbers I didn't recognize really. The banging suddenly stopped, and I could hear heavy footsteps descend down the outside stairs, right next to the wall near my head. Everything went silent for a few moments, so I tried to settle back down, but now my adrenaline was going crazy. I could feel my legs shaking. I was so nervous about why someone had been outside for so long. There was no way I was getting back to sleep now. Just in that moment, I saw the flashing of a torch through our bedroom window. It flashed at least three times. Then it turned off altogether. I then heard what sounded like a man talking on the phone to someone or having a conversation with someone outside. They sounded both agitated and quite angry. I didn't want to look directly outside our bedroom window, just in case the man might see me there. A few minutes later though, I could hear the rumbling of a car engine below me. I then assumed he'd driven to our place and stopped there. His voice became increasingly explosive and I became more and more scared. It got to the point where I was about to phone the police. I heard the man opening his car door and swiftly driving off along the street. I don't know who that man was or what he wanted, but I didn't sleep at all that night. And for the next few days after that, every single noise during the night would give me a fright. I was scared whoever this was was going to come back. Now that's all creepy enough, but the story doesn't end there. In the end, since it was a one-time thing, I just chalked it up to someone with the wrong address, or perhaps a drunk guy who'd gotten the wrong apartment. About a week later, though, we got a knock at the door about half past six in the evening. This was also unusual for such a quiet area. 
neither me or my sister were expecting any mail packages or shopping to be delivered, I decided to open the door and see who had knocked. Initially, I thought it was our neighbor who was my dad's friend, as he had been around every so often to check how we were settling in. But not this time. It was a woman who was dressed in a suit and looked very professional, her hair tied up in a tight bun and holding a clipboard. Well, this was obviously weird. I was a bit anxious and wondered just who this person was. I looked down at her name badge, but I can't quite seem to remember it now. I'll just call her Molly for time saving sake. Molly told me she worked for the criminal court and was looking for this guy we'll call Thomas. He had previously been a tenant at this flat before we moved in a few months before. Molly mentioned something to do with money, but the visit was so vague I don't really remember what she said specifically. She asked if the man still lived there, and I said no, just my sister and I. She asked when we moved in, and what letting agency we were with. I think that was just to confirm that we did in fact live there. She seemed nice and professional, got the information she needed, and left right away. I'm guessing money is the reason why that creepy guy turned up a few nights previously, banging loudly on our door. I'm glad I didn't answer it that night, and made sure it was locked. Fuck knows what would have happened if he thought me and my sister were the man that he and the courts were looking for to get that money back. I'm happy to say since then we've had no further disturbances, but it still gives me the chills just thinking about it. I'm a 26 year old female who's about 5 foot nothing and generally very harmless looking. I have no idea what it is about being seemingly harmless, but it always seems to attract a whole array of bad news. Don't believe me? Go ask any soft spoken tiny person, especially a girl who gives you the first impression, isn't she just adorable? More than likely all of them will have their fair share of stories to make you worry for your sanity. This is compounded by my attitude of I'll be sugar, rainbows, and sunshine right up until you give me a reason not to be. As you can imagine, a job in retail makes this whole personality cocktail about as fun as bamboo splinters under your fingernails. Whoever came up with that idea that the customer is always right needs to be shot, resurrected, and shot again. That said, I will do anything within the limits of my job for a customer. I like helping them out. I mean, most retail workers do, especially if you're polite. A little lesson to be had here for those of you who've never worked in a service-based company. A lot of employees actually do want to help you, so just let them. You'll both walk away from the encounter in a much better mood and better frame of mind as well. And if they can't, ask yourself if it's a situation beyond their control first. If the answer is anywhere close to yes or it might be, just let them off the hook. I've seen way too many retail employees get a look of dread on their face when something goes wrong. It bothers me every single time because I know what it's like to think, great, now I'm going to get yelled at and called names for something I can't do anything about. Maybe they'll even call in about me and then my boss will be wondering what in God's name I'm doing. You know, what can said employee even do about it? Just sit there and take it while apologizing for your inconvenience. But I digress. I work as an overnight supervisor to a 24-hour drug store. As with any 24-hour store, we get plenty of creepy people rolling on in, being a fair-sized city with only two 24-hour pharmacies in town. I have plenty of real weird stories. Maybe I'll share a few more at a later date. The evening of this particular incident had me working a Saturday night shift with two other front-end employees. Saturday nights mean ad tags. We overnighters, the few, the lucky, and the brave are the ones stuck with this joyful job. Ten hours straight of monotony, and a lot of back and forth around the store. Usually those nights pass with some regulars, some meth heads, some regular meth heads, and on occasion a sick person, or a person with a sick loved one at home. Most intoxicated people are in and out in a flash but I've noticed the more out of their wits they are, the higher the potential for something dangerous is. You learn very quickly to watch the ones with the nervous twitches. 
It was about 1.30 a.m. when this taller, very wiry man walked into my store. His dark brown hair was cropped pretty short, and he was dressed fairly casually as well. I didn't even realize his presence in the store until the cashier for the night, Daniel, came up to me and muttered something about this weird guy just wandering around in circles in front of the store. Daniel was middle-aged, but mischievous and crotchety are two very apt descriptions of him. You never quite know when he's just stirring the pot for fun. I searched for this mystery guy to see what was bothering him. I've been thinking it was more than likely he just noticed something strange about some guy shoplifting. This would not be the first or last time he over-enthusiastically called someone a shoplifter, who turned out to be some poor, exhausted father or something sent to get some cold medicine. I found the man slowly pacing along the front wall and asked if he needed any help in my cheeriest customer service voice. The moment he turned around, I froze. This man was radiating violence. It surrounded him like an aura. I couldn't pinpoint what was bothering me exactly. He had this weird expression on his face, or perhaps the way he was standing. He was so tense during my entire experience with him. It was like he was ready to go off at the first provocation. Truthfully, I still haven't quite figured it out. It was just, there was something wrong with him when I was looking at him. Immediately uncomfortable. I was all too happy when he muttered, Oh, no, I'm, I'm just looking, sorry. I never have quite figured out how to gracefully exit when a customer has nothing left to say to you but stands there staring, almost expectant, even if it's not necessarily. After a minute or so of avoiding meeting this man's eyes, I told him my usual line of, All right, well, let us know if you need anything in the future. I backed away into the aisle I'd emerged from, and hurried off to busy myself with more ad tags. Daniel could keep an eye on this guy if he felt like it. The dude was scary, and I was the only female on shift. They don't pay me enough to deal with stuff like that. It was not long before I started to feel like I was being watched, though. I could see creepy suspect number one lurking at the top of the aisles, peeking over and staring at me. I finished all of the tags in line for that aisle, and was relieved when I had to move across the store for others in a different section. Again, a few moments pass by, and that weird prickly feeling hits me once more. I can see him peeking around the corner at the end of the aisle, staring right at me. I called out once more for a second time to ask if there was anything I could help him find. He immediately busied himself pretending to pick up some vitamins he'd randomly seen. He gave me a creepy grin, and told me again he was just looking. Yeah, sure, I bet you were. This continued for a half hour or so, until I find myself heading up to the front to ring up a customer. I had no idea where Daniel was at this point, but I guess it didn't matter too much. I was just grateful for the distraction. That was until I noticed the creeper following me up to the register, still staring. I conducted the transaction as quickly as possible, and after a few too many nervous glances in that creep's direction, the customer took off like someone had just lit him on fire. I decided now was a good time to go out for my lunch break. It was cold. I thought maybe since Mr. Creeper didn't have a particularly warm-looking coat on, he'd leave me alone out in that weather. I searched out one of my co-workers and let them know my intentions. I clocked out and stepped outside and into my car. Now, normally I try to avoid smoking in it. I've never liked the way it stinks up everything, but desperate times call for desperate measures. I locked the car doors and rolled down the window just far enough to fit my cigarette through to ash it. I picked up a book and turned to the page I'd left off and settled in. Only a few paragraphs in, I could hear someone banging on my window now. I jumped up startled and looked. Guess who? That's right, Mr. Creepy. He grinned at me in what I'm sure was supposed to be a sheepish fashion, but instead came out looking more like Norman Bates, if you know what I mean. I asked him again if there was something he needed from me. He said he'd been looking for something in particular the entire time, and now he needed my help. I told him very firmly there were two other employees in the store that would have to help him. I was currently off the clock. He frowned, and after a moment of me pointedly ignoring him in favor of tensely not being able to concentrate on my book while pretending to read, he walked back inside. My lunch break ended soon after, but I still hadn't seen him come back out. 
I hurried inside, clocked in, and called the other shift supervisor, Mark, into the office. I explained the entire situation to him and asked if he could go deal with that dude. Mark sighed, nodded, and went out to talk to the guy. I busied myself in the office with some training sessions I'd been putting off for a while. Mark rushed back inside the office, wearing a very bewildered and concerned look. I raised an eyebrow and he sat down. Dude, that guy was really weird. Yeah, weird is not quite the adjective I'd use. What did he say? Well, he wanted to talk to you again. I told him you had other things you needed to be doing, but I'd be happy to help him, and he just got angry. You thought he was freaky beforehand. He visibly shuddered, and I raised an eyebrow again. He asked if I knew what time you got off and where you lived. What the fuck? Exactly, I told him we were legally obligated to not share that information, and if he wasn't going to buy anything he needed to leave, he just took off running. I followed him out just in case. He was looking around your car until he noticed I had followed. Then he ran off to his car in the distance and hurried out. I decided I was not going to stick around to see if he was going to come back, and noped out for the rest of my shift. Shortly after, my store set up a guard contract with the local police department, and I've never seen that man there since. I was 15 and had a boyfriend who lived 8 miles away from my house. We used to sneak out and visit each other often at night, but we didn't have cars so we would always have to walk the entire distance. Either he'd walk over to my house or I walk down to his. One of these nights, I had visited his place, and it was getting late around 2 or 3 in the morning. I had to leave. I started down the main road as usual, when I heard a car slow down behind me. I glanced over to my left, and saw an older, beat-up car pull in next to me. The guy driving looked quite young, older than me, but still only in his early 20s. He asked me if I wanted a ride. No thanks, I'm good. He asked again and I thought about how I had just started this 8 mile trek, and how I had such a long way to go now. I thought to myself, ah, fuck it, why not? I jumped into his car, happy to skip all that way. First thing I noticed while inside was the very heavy scent of alcohol in the air. It was almost overpowering. He was also staring at me so hard that he nearly swerved and slammed into a ditch on the side of the road. Hey, watch it! What are you doing? I yelled. I was a smart-ass teenager back then. The guy just gave me a goofy, drunken smile. He was driving really slow now, too. I'm not sure why, but out of all the red flags that had presented themselves, his super slow driving was what bothered me the most. Now I'm just going to stop here and remind you guys I was a really naive 15-year-old. Up to this point, I had just been annoyed with this dude. Nothing more, really. I had just told him to go straight on this road for a few miles more, when he immediately turned right into this tiny street. Dude, what the fuck are you doing? I said I live over that way. Ah, uh, come on, we're just going to my friend's house. I said, fuck no, take me home. He just ignored me though. He kept staring at me, and driving super slow. I demanded he stop the car now, and he ignored me again. Luckily, we were going slow enough that, extremely pissed off, I opened my car door and jumped out of the moving car. I still fell down hard. I got up and started walking away angrily, a little bit hurt. He was already out of his car though, and he blocked my path forward. He clutched my arm so hard it left a bruise and pulled me over to his car. He sat down in the driver's seat and told me to crawl over him into the passenger side. I pulled and yanked trying to get away, but this guy was deceptively strong. This is when I finally started to get scared of this situation. He would not let me go, and he was now basically kidnapping me. A horrible feeling of dread just washed over me. A horrible feeling of dread just washed over me. I was looking up at the moon. It was so big and beautiful. So many nights I had marveled at its beauty just like I felt it now bearing witness to my future demise. I burst into tears. When I did, he reflexively loosened his grip on me. 
I saw this as a chance to fucking run. I lived in a small town, so we had many fields of orchards and crops between the residential areas. I broke free from his grip and ran off into a cornfield that was just off the road. The man started shouting at me to stop and started chasing me through the field. The stalks were taller than me, so I ran through them in zigzags trying to lose him. I even lost a boot in the dirt. He was falling farther and farther behind me. After that, the field ended. There was a single abandoned house that sat right next to the road. I banged on the door hoping that maybe I had only thought it was abandoned, but there was no answer. Surrounding the house were flat fields and just the main road. I couldn't take any chances running through those because the moon was so bright that night. I was absolutely sure he would see me. Instead, I climbed the big tree in front of the house as high as I could, hoping he wouldn't be able to see me in the canopy. He came out of the cornfields. I could see him below, searching all over for me. I was terrified. I could only cry silently, praying he would never look up. Luckily, after a while, he just gave up and walked back to his car. I thought that was going to be the end of it, but he got in his car and drove up and down the main road, looking for me the entire time. I was up in that tree holding on so long I was starting to get physically tired. I couldn't believe just how hard he was looking for me. For a while, he would even get out of the car and look deeper into the areas off the road to see if I was hiding there. Then he'd jump back in and go up and down either really fast or really slow, like he was doing a grid search or something. After a few hours, he finally went away. After 30 minutes passed without seeing his car, I finally decided to come down and head home. Again, because the moon was so bright and the fields ahead were so low, I had to crawl through them, scared shitless he might turn around and come back and see me off the main road and chase me again. When I got home, it was already dawn. I was shoeless and covered in dirt, grateful to be home still. Needless to say, I never walked that street alone again at night. Here's some background information before I fully launch into my story. At the time of this encounter, I was 16 years old and participating in an exchange program. My high school in America was partnered with a high school in Germany. I had been learning German since kindergarten. Every year or so, about 10 or so kids from the German program at my high school would get to go and live in Germany with a host family for the summer. My exchange partner Vanessa and I got along great. As it turned out, my best friend Rebecca was also on the exchange with me and her exchange partner, Anne Catherine, was best friends with Vanessa. Needless to say, the four of us were basically inseparable. One day, we decided to head into Nuremberg to do some shopping. Vanessa and Anne Catherine lived on the same street, so the four of us walked to the little subway train station thing by their house. They lived about 10 minutes outside the city, so the subway train ride wasn't very long at all. As we were taking the escalator down to catch the subway, though, we could hear someone whistling at us. Thinking it would be some dumb boy messing around, we turned around to see who it was. We hear the whistling sound once again and lock eyes with this man standing at the top of the escalator. We were on the down one, so we locked eyes right as we passed by each other. This man was probably in his late 50s or early 60s, and he was gigantic. I mean, he must have been around 6 foot 7 in height and easily close to 300 pounds. Stupidly, the four of us waved at him. We were just messing around, and we didn't think this guy would think much of it at all. Much to our chagrin, though, he took this as an invitation to begin terrorizing us. Immediately, the man starts sprinting up the escalator. Once he gets to the top, he hops onto the down escalator and begins shoving people out of the way just to get to us. For a big guy, this dude sure could move fast. It was apparent this man now wanted to get to us, though the people surrounding us probably thought he had left something on a train or something and wanted to get it before it was too late. At this point, we had basically reached the bottom, so the four of us took off running. By the grace of God, the train we needed had just pulled up. We ran onto the train and sat down, 
relieved we'd seemingly gotten away from this scary guy. At least, we thought so. The train we were on was separated into sections, so there were see-through doors you had to go through if you wanted to get to a different one. About a minute or so into our subway ride, we see this guy moving through the section in front of ours. We immediately stand up and sprint to the next section, hoping we'd find a more crowded car we could hide in. This continued for a few more cars, until we realized we'd reached the very front of the train. We sit down in the four seats closest to the front, and sure enough the man bursts into our section, throwing open the door. He sits in the single seat across from us, and positions himself so he has a clear view of all four of us. He then starts laughing, real deep and slow-like. We were all trying very hard not to look at him, but out of the corner of my eye, I could see his eyes were unblinking and bulging out of his head. He was grinning in such a malicious way, and he had even started to drool as well. He licked his lips like a cartoon villain, honestly. We started whispering to each other in English, hoping this guy's English wasn't strong enough to understand. We decided collectively that at our next stop we were going to sprint off the train and find a policeman, or anyone who could help us. The train got to our stop, and we bolted. Luckily, our stop was pretty crowded, so we were hoping to duck out of sight, then find that policeman we were talking about. We turned around to make sure he wasn't behind us. The guy hadn't gotten off the train yet, but he had shifted so he had a clear view of us from the window by his seat. We watched for a while as the train began to pull away. The man widened his smile and began to slowly wave at us as he pulled off. I swear he didn't break eye contact once or stop waving until the train was entirely out of sight. I really don't know what that guy wanted with us or why he was so hell-bent on chasing us through that train. Maybe he was planning on getting off at our stop with us, but when he saw how crowded it was, decided to just stay. He knew he wouldn't get away with whatever he was plotting. All I know in the end, though, is that I was scared absolutely shitless by this guy. Hi everyone, I'm just going to get right into this story. I was working at a skating rink back in 2013, and I absolutely loved it. Working behind the snack bar was pretty easy, and I usually made pretty good tips as well. After about a year of working there, I had come accustomed to random dads hitting on me, creepy teenagers staring at me, and all that sorts of things. Even when I was hosting a child's sixth birthday party, the dads would make sexual comments or make me the butt of their dirty jokes. Eh, whatever. Women get used to that sort of thing after a while. Flash forward to summer of 2014, though. I had just turned 18 years old and was excited to start being considered an adult. I was working one of the school functions when this older man walked up to the snack bar window Damn, did you know you're gorgeous, he said. Ugh, please, not now. I have 50 slices of pizza in my hand and a million little brats to keep from falling over. Oh, thanks, I appreciate it. I smiled back. I'm not sure why, but I just can't seem to figure out how to act under pressure, especially when it involves another person. I guess I just hate feeling awkward or uncomfortable when talking to someone. I always try and be polite and well-mannered, because that's just how I was raised. What's your number? I have to have your number. What is it? He was so pushy and excited I already felt uncomfortable. I just kind of looked back at him, then all around me. I smiled and didn't say anything, hoping he'd just walk away when I didn't seem interested. Come on, just give me your number. What do you think I am? I'm just being friendly, just paying you a compliment. Blah blah, yeah right. You know how someone is just trying to make themselves look like a victim to make you feel guilty? That's exactly the way he was acting. After like 10 minutes of me politely declining his offers and refusing to give my number, I just broke down and gave it to him. I figured I could always just ignore the messages and block him, like any other loser guy who tried to squeeze my personal info out of me. The same night at around 2 a.m., I got a text from a random number. Hey, yo, this is Jeffrey. Read at 2.04 a.m. You remember me from Skate City, right? 
red at 2.06 a.m. Come on, hit me up, I'd love to take you out. I just ignored every single message he sent. I was still hoping he'd take the hint that a 5'2", 18-year-old would not be interested in a 35-year-old father. Still though, he continued to send me annoying texts every single day. Some were about how he'd treat me better than any man has. Sometimes they were about how I was stuck up and owed him a response since I gave him my number, like he'd somehow forgotten he forced me to in the first place. This went on for a couple of weeks. Every few days, I'd get like six texts in a row, and then it would be silent for a couple days after. I wasn't too, too worried about Jeffrey, though. I had only seen him the one time at work. Everything else was basically just texts, and that's it. That was until one night I had been closing for work. The typical closing shift was 4 to 11 p.m., but Sundays were family dinner, where everyone working that night sat down and ate pizza together. The time was reaching close to 10.30 p.m. I had been expecting my friend Aaron to come in and help me finish my deep cleaning list. My phone rang. It was a number I had not saved. I was usually too lazy to save contacts in my phone, especially with someone I didn't talk to very often. I picked up the call right away, thinking it was Aaron. Hello? I answered. Hey, where you at? A voice said casually. Oh, I'm working at closing. Are you here yet? I'm done vacuuming and I could use some help. Oh, I see. I got gotcha. you. Now after a few seconds on the phone and hearing the voice a couple of times, I started to feel uneasy. My stomach flipped and I felt a little bit odd. This didn't sound like Aaron. Aaron, I said, too scared to really say much else. This ain't Aaron, you bitch. You remember me? Fuck. I stood still. I didn't know what to say. I looked at my phone and noticed the number looked similar to Jeffrey's, the one I had been ignoring, but was slightly different. Is this Jeffrey? I asked, trying to sound normal. Yeah, it is. I have a couple questions for you. How come you think you're too good for me? How old are you anyway? Who the fuck do you think you are, you bitch? I just stayed silent. I said, how fucking old are you? I'm 16. I lied about my age, thinking being underage would scare him away. Huh. Oh yeah? What year were you born in? I couldn't even move, let alone figure out a fake birth year. I just stuttered, uh, uh, for a couple of seconds before he cut me off. Yeah, that's what I thought. How old are you really? I panicked and hung up on him. I felt like my heart was gonna pop out of my fucking chest. The whole thing just made me so uneasy. A few minutes later, I got another call, but I didn't answer it. He left a voicemail for me. I was debating on whether I should listen to it now or later, but I decided to just do it right then. You know, your last day never feels like it's going to be your last. End message. Right away, I started freaking out. I mean, to me, it sounded like this guy was going to come fucking kill me. I go to call my dad and boom, my phone goes dead immediately. Now I'm really losing my shit. Jeffrey knew only a few things about me for certain at this point. One, the skate rink I worked at. Two, that I'm closing tonight. And three, I'm not really 16. The worst scenarios are running through my head as I'm desperately trying to get a hold of my dad. Finally, he picked me up and agreed to take me home. We decided to leave my car there just in case. My dad said if someone were to be waiting for me, they could watch me get into my car and follow me home. When he pulled up to the building, I ran straight up to the passenger side door and jumped right in. Now, being an employee, I'm sure a lot of you have that employee parking. Well, ours was around the corner of the building, right next to an empty wooded area in this little stream. It was very dark at night due to lack of lighting. As we pulled out of the parking lot, my dad and I both look out towards my car. Up against the building wall is this tall, dark-clothed guy just barely out of view of my car. I start freaking out. My dad calls the cops, explaining everything that had happened. Luckily, our friend Wes happened to be a cop as well. He happened to be one of the cars that pulled up to the scene. We just kept driving home, hoping the cops would take care of it and my car would be safe. We got home that night and I plugged in my phone. I received a text from Jeffrey's number. I guess I'll have to wait then. 
The next day, Wes called my dad. He said the man he talked to was named Jeffrey so-and-so. I can't share his full name, obviously. He said they went up and talked to him, saying there was a call for suspicious behavior. The man had told them he was just waiting for his girlfriend. Wes told Jeffrey he was aware that he was harassing me, and that that was my car he was lingering in front of. He asked Jeffrey about the voicemail, and told him that the PD could consider it a threat. Jeffrey said something like, That's just my motto, or some dumb shit like that. Wes told Jeffrey that contacting me in any way would be considered harassment, and that he would be taken straight to jail if he tried to see or speak with me in any form. I never did hear from Jeffrey again after that. Not that I'm exactly complaining. 